Hey, Kees. Hey. Kees. Hallo. Alles goed? Zeker. Hoe is het uh, niet meer op de artikel? Hier mooi Nee, nee, maar zo. Dus. Ik dacht dat het al. Ja. Oh, net, net een nieuwe kantine. Kan je er geen... Uh, kan je er niet schijnen? <laughs> Weet je wel, Kees? Een nieuwe... Uh, ja, ik heb nog een beetje geholpen bij... Uh, ja. 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 Maar helaas, ja, had ik niet zo Nee. Ja, ik heb het wel gedaan. Ja. Ingepraat, ja. dat doet ook niet. Nee. Maar toen je vertelde dat hij niet aan wedstrijden mee heeft, dacht ik al van, oh, wat is, wat is dan nog de motivatie? Ja. Nee, uh, ja, ja. 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 Dat is een je geven om naar de training te gaan, maar dat is ook wel een Ja, leuk. Iets leven is niet zo ontvankelijk voor het uitzicht van medailles en dat soort dingen. Ja, ja, ja. Nee, die voorbij. Ja, ja. Zit te geven, ja. Dat is toch nog mooi de klant van. Ja. Het gaat over pubers. Ja, dat is goed. Je hebt vast ook de uitzending op tv gezien dat je Nee, dat is niet. 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 Dat is
photos for you. Yes, I have to put the pictures. Yeah, so I can pay for the presentation and for the community. There's some really nice ones. And shall I send them directly? Yes, So maybe in the break you can give them an address and I send them to you. Yes, please. Please. Yeah. Welcome everyone. In my capacity as clerk of the court for intergenerational climate crimes, the CICC, I hereby declare this court in session. The case will be heard by chairing Judge Rada de Souza, Judge Sharon H. Venn, Razihan Maharaj, and Nicolas Hildyard, who is about to walk in. Yes, Judge is present. I want to thank all of you, uh, members of the public jury, for venturing the storm and being present here today to evaluate uh, the case that will be discussed before this court. I hand over to Chair and Judge Rada de Souza. Welcome, everyone, to this uh, hearing, and good morning to all of you. This is the court for intergenerational climate crimes. And yesterday, we heard a case brought against Unilever and the state of Netherlands from comrades past, present, and future in India, in Kenya, and the Congo. The first case that this court heard was against the state of Netherlands, brought by Bolivia and by Peru and uh, by uh, Mongolia. Today, you will be hearing evidence. You will be invited to assess that evidence and make a decision 
in your role as public jury. I want to remind you that you are here as members of the jury. And as members of the jury, you have an important responsibility to discharge. And that responsibility is to listen to the evidence carefully first and to assess and evaluate that decision and to come to a, dis a conclusion that sits with your conscience. The law that we apply in this court is not the law that applies outside this court. In this court, we apply the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act. You will have seen a copy of that act hanging outside the court as you enter. You also have a copy of the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act, which appears on page 24 of the yellow booklet. Please take time to go through that act and please take time to reflect on the evidence that you hear and the law that you will be applying when you assess the evidence. Uh, you have received a package which contains transcripts of video, uh, the, the subtitles, which is also part of your uh, package. You will also have received a handout on the ING and its relations to SOCFIN, which, as, which has been presented as additional evidence. Please go through them as well. The video and photo materials that are produced will serve the case in front of you today, as well as future cases, which will be used in other prosecutions under the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act. With those briefing comments, I will now hand over to the clerk to please call out the case for today. The case we are hearing today is case number three of 2021. The complainants are comrades of the Netherlands, comrades past, present and future in Indonesia, comrades past, present and future in Cameroon, and comrades past, present and future in Brazil versus ING Group and the state of the Netherlands. May I now call upon the prosecutor for this court, Rodrigo Fernandez, who is a researcher at the Center for Research on Multinational Corporations, or SOMO. Mr. Prosecutor, please present your case to the jury. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, honorable judges. Uh, it is a great honor to deliver this statement uh, on the third day of the Intergenerational Court of Climate Justice. Uh, I'm here to present uh, the case of the ING Bank. Could you uh, move to the next slide, please? <clears throat> uh, in this presentation, I will focus first on the present and the past, and then dedicate the second part to the future. Um, so, when it comes to the present, in the past, uh, it is quite clear that ING and other uh, systemic banks uh, on this planet are on the wrong side of history. It is in the DNA of finance capital to profit from externalizing, that is ignoring, uh, the state of the planet. The business model is to receive fees and interest income from arranging loans and profitable activities uh, without any regard to the environment. This logic is what created the Capitalocene. This is the geological footprint of capitalism. Um, in order to move forward, one of the steps is that the bank needs to, the ING bank needs to take responsibility 
for the brown assets it owned or created. Uh, this, of course, uh, as a fact of its business model. It needs to formulate a credible and measurable exit strategy. At the moment, it has done no such thing. Could you move to the next slide, please? Five years ago, a complaint was filed to the OECD guidelines on multinational corporations, in which the case was made that ING was in violation of the OECD guidelines on climate change. On this slide, you can see what the response of ING was. So first of all, uh, it is of the opinion of the ING bank that complaints are premature and unnecessary. Secondly, it states that for the moment, there are no clear data sources to provide any measurable tools to evaluate its activities. So simply, it cannot measure its, its own activities. And, and thirdly, it states that although there is some sort of a Paris climate agreement, this only holds for states. Corporations, they are relevant to it, but only voluntarily. Could you go to the next slide, please? So, if we look at the portfolio of energy investments by ING, this is the, the left uh, circle, we can clearly see that uh, in the last three years, uh, the, the volume of investments it made, it intermediated, was in the range of 9.1 billion uh, euros. 25% of it, roughly, uh, went to so-called green assets, green investments, which are problematic themselves. We will discuss it later. But still, 75% of its energy investments go to brown assets. This, is, this has been the last three years. Uh, if we look at it, its peers, uh, other large systemic banks uh, in the world, we can see that this division is 50-50. So among its peers, ING, is doing worse. Could you please go to the next slide, please? So, seeing the arguments put forward by ING and seeing how it is investing, I think it's quite clear in the present that we have to stand ground and say, we don't really have time uh, for games anymore. In the history of capitalism, we have seen different episodes of financialization. Um, we are living through one right now. And uh, financialization, well, to uh, reduce a whole library in something very brief, basically comes down to, or what is the most relevant part of it for us right now, is that finance, financial actors, uh, from being simply servants to society, uh, become the dominant player. And in the process, uh, they introduce all sorts of logics in all sorts of social domains, uh, which changes the behavior and, uh, well, moves the economy and society in a financialized mode. Um, historians of the long durée have uh, recognized that there have been at least four periods in the last 500 years, in the last 500 years of capitalism, of financialization. The financialization is not something that is indefinite. It comes and goes. Uh, so this is important looking towards the future and the role of ING. Financialization is not here to stay. Uh, the business model that created the problem can simply not be the solution. It is not the solution to demand from ING simply to move from green to brown, or sorry, from brown to green assets. Banks, investment funds, like BlackRock, uh, Vanguard, and so on, and the financial system more broadly, needs to abandon the central role they have in allocating capital. Allocating capital is about taking the decision who gets funding, which ideas get realized, and which don't get realized. This important decision needs to be taken away from the financial sector. This is about definancializing. 
Yeah, we don't have the luxury to experiment with market-based solutions. Uh, I'm sure you're all very much familiar with them, like ESG standards for green finance. I just would like to ask you, think of the situation in the Second World War. How do you think the US war economy would have been able to produce the necessary equipment in the limited time span it had if it would have used ESG standards or market-based solutions? The allocation of capital through financial actors was put on hold because there was a greater good uh, and I think that the climate deserves to be treated at least in that manner. Thank you. Um, so, from here I would like to move to the future. And this becomes a little bit more complicated. Uh, the future of the Capitello Seine is a labyrinth. Um, it is unclear how we get out of the current situation. There are many obstacles. Could you go to the next slide, please? So first of all, we need to recognize um, that the future is not binary. It's not about yes or no. Uh, it is about direction. Where do we go from here? And there's many different places we can end up with. Uh, end up with. Uh, it is also about the power of imaginaries. Uh, this is very important. Uh, and at the current moment, we need to acknowledge uh, the degree of structural power that ING and its other peer banks, systemic banks, enjoy, together with other large corporations on this planet. And structural power essentially is the ability to control the narrative, the power to determine what is real, desirable, and reasonable. In an age of monopoly capitalism, big tech, big pharma, big oil, big banks, we see how structural power is converted into infrastructural power. <clears throat> infrastructural power is about sovereignty, the ability of states to enforce policies. When it comes to the COVID pandemic, I think it's clear to everyone, uh, states have become dependent on big pharma. And big pharma, of course, is dependent on states uh, because this is how they maintain their infrastructural power. Uh, in the same way, we see that when it comes to thinking and this devising policies of how we're going to change our ener energetic system, big banks and big oil present themselves as gatekeepers. Gatekeepers of the imaginaries. They are not simply corporations, but they are equal partners to states. Without them, states cannot exercise their role. Without them, states are simply lose their sovereignty. So this provides additional power resources to shape the way we think about the future. And this is something we need to be aware of. The next slide, please. Okay, so bear with me. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not... Uh, an artist. Uh, it, is, it may look like a, a complicated slide, probably it is, but um, this could be seen as a map. Uh, so what we see from the left to the right is basically it's about the mobilization of financial resources. Mobilization of financial resources, by that I, uh, I mean not simply the spending of money, uh, but uh, how much financial resources are put available. So this can come as public funds, fiscal spending by states, monetary uh, policies, central banks, but also all sorts of private monies and private funding and loans. And what we can see is, if we move to the right, there are the, the, the different projects or different imaginaries bring with them different needs in terms of the mobilization of financial resources. If we, if we go from below to the top, below basically is the current state of low regulatory reform, 
uh, we start with the neoliberal system we have today, the product of 40 years of deregulation. And if we move up, uh, a more and more state intervention is included. And what this map tries to show or put or inject into the discussion is that there's a trade-off between spending more, mobilizing more, and having a much more active role for the state. And the state can be problematic itself. It's not simply about state intervention, it's also about democratizing and small scale and rescaling of decision making from the core to the peripheries and so on. But um, essentially, ING Bank, the problem it has towards the future, the reason why we're here, is that it is part of a very dominant imaginary, uh, very dominant in the newspapers everywhere we are, and it is the right blue dot of green capitalism. Uh, so this green capitalism, this is the dream, of course, ING and other fellow uh, uh, financial actors uh, want to see realized. <clears throat> this is a maximum of financial resources being uh, allocated to this project, uh, de-risking by the state, subsidies by the states, they reap the profits uh, with a minimum of regulation. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, the next slide. Okay, so the key problem of this and why ING cannot be part of a future solution lies um, in the epistemology of financialization. This is the lens through which capitalist financial market actors see and judge the world around them and shape it. Uh, this is simply the way they interact with the world around them. It is very difficult to ask them not to be that. Climate, if we look at this dot, blue dot on the right part of the, the map I just presented, climate is only relevant if it is bankable, if it can be turned into a profitable, tradable financial asset. It is the, not only the financialization, but the assetization of the climate transition. That is what we're talking about here. So it is this very logic that created the problem of the capitalo sane uh, in the first place by externalizing the past, the present, and the future of the planet. And next slide, please. <clears throat> so, what needs to be done to re-embed finance and ING in a democratic decision-making system? So, if we want to take away finance from taking the important decisions, it's not something that we can simply ask them, ask banks to do. Um, it requires a much broader transformation. So one of the things that really needs to be addressed is the current prioritization of shareholders, shareholder value, not in banks, but in all publicly listed corporations to start with. This is draining the planet, draining resources that we need to invest to redistribute to other parts of the corporation, of the society, towards the future. A market-based allocation of financial resources need to be contained. Again, think of the war economy in the Second World War. It is possible. Uh, it is not hard to think of. It simply needs to be done. Uh, I think that I'm organizing, for instance, uh, a Halloween party for my daughter's tomorrow. I think there's more coordination in that than currently we see uh, when we think of coordinating between large financial, financial actors of how we think of the future. Um, let me see where we are. We need to democratize uh, the allocation of financial resources. It's not simply enough to have the state introduce more types of regulation if the state is captured by private actors. It is democratization that is 
much more important than only state intervention, but it comes after it. And intergenerational justice requires a long-term policy-making capability. And this is perhaps the hardest part. At the moment, uh, political decision-making, political culture and institutions, they cannot deal with short-term pain for long-term gains. But this is exactly what intergenerational justice is about. Uh, and, and this requires a, a redesign of our institutional framework that is obsessed by the present, uh, uh, is built upon externalizing the future and the past. Um, and this is why I think that if we want ING to be part of a future role, to have a future role, it needs to be embedded in another redesigned institutional framework, for otherwise it will, because that's, it is in the nature of ING, it is in the DNA of the financial system, always be violating the principles of intergenerational justice. Uh, so thank you, that was the case. May I now ask the judges if they have any questions for the prosecutor? Sharon Wen, Nicholas Heldyard, Rasigan Maharaj, do you have any questions or clarifications that you need to put to the prosecutor? Yeah. Where would you like me to go? Oh, sorry, I have to ask you. Stop. I'll stand over here. Yes, I, I have some questions for the prosecutor. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to get a little specific, some, some specific examples um, relating back to the charge sheet, uh, to the role of the Dutch state, um, and particularly the role of the Dutch state, as alleged, in <clears throat> using its authority to uh, make laws that prioritize the survival of ING over um, ordinary citizens um, and human and non-human. So I'd like to, I wonder whether you could um, uh, elucidate a bit on steps that the, uh, the Dutch state may or may not have taken to deregulate the banking system in order to enable precisely the financialization that you've been uh, very eloquently set out, uh, and also the failure to regulate or to leave it entirely to, no, uh, the failure of the Dutch state to intervene to make mandatory some of the standards that um, banks like ING, I mean ING specifically, the environmental, social and good governance standards, ESG standards, um, the failure to make them mandatory as opposed to purely voluntary. I wonder whether you could just um, elaborate a bit on, on, on those two points. So, so it's really the role of the Dutch state in creating an environment in which, which prioritizes the activities of ING and over the social good, and also the failure to uh, prescribe the limits of ING's um, environmental and social and good governance behavior. Thank you for, the, for these questions. These are uh, quite broad questions uh, to elaborate on this in this limited time span. But yeah, to start with the first question, basically ING is a very good example of how boring banking, which used to be the norm, uh, in the period from post-war period, uh, how that transformed into yeah, the, the Anglo-American investment banking oriented type of banking uh, that, well, so, uh, um, so radically exploded in everyone's faces in 2007. Uh, the role of the Dutch state in this transformation I think it, it is, well, it's twofold. On the one hand, it, it uh, 
the political economy of the deregulation of the banking system is one of uh, basically rescaling. So the, 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 the regulatory authority moved to the European Union's level, which uh, of course is or can be seen as a, as a, as a, as a tool for neoliberal uh, transformation. Uh, so in that sense, it was not the hand of the Dutch state, but it was much more the hand of the European Union that is uh, largely responsible for setting out the, the type of regulatory transformations that made these changes at the ING. But on the other hand, what the Dutch state did is that it took away a very successful and very, I think, real existing tool it had to deal with long-term financial needs. And that was its, the, the, the pension fund that uh, this week was in the news for divesting from, uh, among other, Shell, the ABP, set up in 1924. This fund was able to invest to build up the Netherlands after the Second World War, to build all the necessary uh, infrastructure that we have today still functioning to, 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 to help the water, to keep the water out. This was not done by private finance. None of it was ever financed by public banks, uh, by private banks. So this tool shown its effectiveness, this was basically privatized. So it was not really the hand of deregulating ING, that I think that is the problem, but taking away a, a functioning public financial institution and enlarging the scope for private banks, such as ING and other banks, to step into that void. Uh, so I think that the, the two processes of deregulating, allowing the deregulation, being part of the EU train of deregulation, and on the other hand, uh, expanding the market for banks in this crucial field, uh, this is really, I think, the, the, this, these are the problems that the, the Dutch state uh, created. And, uh, and as far as the, the, the ESG uh, moving from voluntary <clears throat> to mandatory, uh, I think this is clearly uh, re related to uh, political decision making uh, and it's not necessarily related to the institutions or the state. It's not that it's not possible, but it's, uh, it's, it's the unwillingness of the dominant uh, political ideas in this country. Mm -hmm. yeah. So thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo. Excellent presentation as well, yeah? Uh, you know, in the presentation, um, as you, uh, you know, showed us the slides and we could see, even the diagram was quite good <laughs> in terms of shaping some, but it's also written in a language that's quite specialist, yeah? So when we use the term like neoliberalism, so we're carrying a lot of baggage inside such a term. Hmm? And as you say, there's a 40-year period for the establishment of this. So in, the, uh, in your response to my colleague Nick's question, you mentioned also how the European Union uh, has certain responsibilities transferred to it. But these responsibilities from a national entity called the Dutch government yeah, does not remove the Dutch government from being party to it. It is the EU as much as the EU is it. So I wonder if you wouldn't mind just clarifying, you know, besides the detailed technical terms itself, how does this pan out, you know? As you explained just now, it's quite simple in terms of removing public and private, substituting them over time. But there seems to have been, from what you presented, an objective in that. And that objective is deepening financialization, as I read it. So if you would comment just a little about that, because I worry a bit that the language is pitched at economists, <laughs> and I understand very well, but I think just to make it available to everyone as well, to understand that phenomena. Please. Yeah, thank you for this uh, question of clarification. Um, so yeah, I think this is first and foremost a historical process with many moving parts and historical accidents. It's not necessarily uh, a plan that 
somebody put on the table and that was executed. Um, there was, uh, it is a story of different strategies that existed in different countries. Uh, countries that were closed, had closed borders that were inward looking uh, in the post-war period. And then uh, as globalization appeared, capital became more mobile to move from one country to the other. Suddenly uh, heightened competition appeared and suddenly we see that the way in which finances were organized uh, had, were becoming outdated very quickly. And uh, this was the context in the 1980s. Uh, the Big Bang in the city of London by Margaret Thatcher, uh, of which she was so proud. Um, this pushed forward uh, many transformations, not because there was a plan, but because uh, there were uh, interests, private interests, clashing sometimes with public interest, uh, but they, they could not transform that easily in all of these national spaces of decision making. Uh, perhaps in some parts they could, like in the UK, perhaps in the Netherlands, but other countries like France or Germany or Italy, the forces of uh, the state, of public authority were, were much stronger. So it's not simply that it is the European Union that did it. It is simply a space in which all of these interests and battles were played out at a different scale, at a different scale of decision making. And this provided more space for private interest to uh, get how they wanted to reorganize the process than they would have probably had at the national scale, where there is much more public scrutiny um, because there is no European citizenship. Uh, and this is also the problem we have still today with many of these long-term transformative processes that you need a citizenry and you need to democratize it because otherwise private interests will always prevail. Um, may I thank you for your responses, Mr. Prosecutor, but may I also ask you, uh, uh, push you a little bit on the democratization issue that you raised. Um, you, I was struck by your distinction between structural power and infrastructural power and how structural power enables infrastructural power, which is basically loss of sovereignty. And then you also mentioned democratization. And you mentioned that infrastructural power and change is long term. And, and taking into consideration some of your responses on the EU, I was wondering, how, there are two distinct time spans here. When we speak about democracy, it is democratic change in most people's minds occurs every time there is an election, there is in four years or five years or whatever the national system is. And on the other hand, infrastructural change requires democratization over a long period of time. So how do you match these two time frames? So if we elect, if the Dutch people elect a government that is willing to put some restrictions on companies like ING or other financial corporations or regulate them, you could very well in four years time have another government that reverses the whole thing. So there are two different time scales here. Related to that, I just have another more specific question. You said that it was EU membership that allowed this expansion of ING to happen. But many people could say that the Dutch people voted to be members of the EU. So how do you explain? That is again another democratization problem. So democracy in the political level and economic level seems to be, there seems to be a tension there. If you could just comment on that. Yes, thank you for these questions. To start with the last one, so I'm not suggesting that it is, to put it simple, the fault of the EU. Uh, no, uh, these countries were part of the EU and so 
therefore logically it happened in the context of the EU. Outside of the EU, in the US, in other countries of the core of the global economy, these processes equally occurred without the EU. So it's not the EU that was pushing forward, it, this was simply the forum, the platform, the, yeah, the space in which this was discussed and decisions were taken. Uh, so, it's, uh, so it's not the EU, uh, it is, of course it is the member states that feed the discussion, that, that, that take the decision in the end. Uh, and yes, uh, the, yeah, the, the, the EU is very complicated, perhaps uh, for, uh, it goes a bit too far in the session to elaborate on that, but uh, uh, yeah, the problem is that it comes with its good and its bad part. Uh, and in the case, in the specific case of deregulating banking practices, moving from this boring banking to, well, Wild West banking we have today, in this period, uh, the authority was m migrated to the top, to the EU. Uh, it doesn't mean that the EU was the, 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 the genius in this. Uh, when it comes to democracy, yes, it is, um, it is true. If we have the, the limited scope of having, if, if we define democracy as, as a very simple electoral method, then yes, you're right. Then there, there, but then there is no such thing as long-term decision-making capabilities. There is no, there, it, it doesn't make sense to, to think of intergenerational justice, uh, because then there's no, it can be terminated anytime. Uh, so th th this is why I think, to embed intergenerational justice in decision-making structures, yeah, there needs to be a, 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 a radical transformation in which we organize uh, these decision-making. Um, and again, yeah, probably it takes a bit too far to discuss that here, but I think it, the, the, the existing method is equally as problematic as, as ESG. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your contributions today. We appreciate it very much here. And I'm sure the jury appreciates your contributions as well. May I now request the clerk of this court to please read out the first charge. Thank you. To the members of the jury, you will find the first charge, first charge in your charge sheet that you all received as part of your file. We're going to read the first charge, first charge concerning comrades past, present and future in Indonesia. Defendant number one, ING Group, jointly and severally with defendant number two, the state of the Netherlands, it is charged with committing crimes under section three of the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act in the Sirebon region of Java in Indonesia by engaging in the following activities. It is alleged inter alia that one, defendant one, the ING group, joined a consortium of artificial legal persons engaged in financial activities, including arranging loans totaling 595 million US dollars to another consortium of artificial legal persons, per, of an artificial legal person led by the Japanese national named Marubeni Corporation, amongst others, and intentionally aided, abetted and financed them to build the Sirbon coal-fired power plant project unit one in the West Java region of Indonesia. Two, that ING group, who are residents of the Netherlands, knowingly financed the destruction of the sources of livelihoods of natural human persons and sources of life for fish, trees and other non-humans whose lives depend on the sea and the coastal ecologies of West Java in order to empower members of the production consortia to build and operate the Sirbon coal-fired power plant project unit one to enrich themselves, the consortia and the state of the Netherlands. Three, that the financial support of ING Group to the Sirbon coal-fired power plant project unit one caused pollution of seas, destroyed the interdependence of different life forms in the coastal regions, the interdependence of human and non-human lives and made the land unfit for cultivation. Four, that the financial support of the ING Group to the Sirbon coal-fired power plant project unit one caused irreversible harm to the health of present and future generations of human and non-humans, disabling both from regenerating themselves and future generations. 
Five, that not notwithstanding the fact that these adverse impacts to the ecologies and communities in the West Java region, which arose from Cyberbon Coal Fired Plant Project Unit 1, had been brought to the attention of the ING Group, ING Group willfully increased its finance by nearly three times and led another consortium of artificial financial legal persons to lend 595 million US dollar dollars for the larger and more destructive Cyberbon Coal Fired Power Plant Project Unit 2. Six, that since 1885, the state of the Netherlands has used its authority to make laws that prioritize the survival of the ING group over humans and non-humans in the region of West Java, Indonesia and elsewhere. Seven, that the state of the Netherlands joined the World Trade Organization, a consortium of states to further expand the scope of activities of the ING group and thereby increase their capacities to destroy lives and livelihoods of humans and non-humans in the West Java region of Indonesia and elsewhere. These activities, if proved to be true, constitute intergenerational climate crimes against past, present and future generations of humans, non-humans, cultures and ecosystems in Indonesia under Section 3, A, B, C and D of the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act. Thank you for that. I will now call upon the, our first witness, to present their evidence in support of the charges uh, against ING Group and the Dutch state. Our first witness is Mikey Pendong, who is Executive Director of the Indonesian Forum for the Environment, WALI, from West Java. On request of the witness, we will first view a short evidentiary video and after that, Mikey Pandong will address the court directly. If you are unable to view the subtitles on screen, a text of the subtitles has been given to you in your handouts, so you may refer them to. Um, so we begin with our first testimony for the day. Pada itu batu panas gatel pada keserangnya tuh mas pengaruh karena di PLTU ya bisa kalau semenjak ada PLTU sih tapi kadang-kadang lu kan mengagetkan wah hari ini ada ya rajungan kadang-kadang hari nantinya nggak ada itu limba iya suara kalau malam berisik kan rusak di laut ada juga serang debunya panas airnya panas kalau apalagi kalau nang mata siapa dari situ kan ada pantonya 20 meter ini pak bukan pantonya pak saya tuh belum ada pantau belum ada bapak saya udah di sini 
saya udah 16 tahun di sini pelayan tapi nggak ada masalah barang ini ada PLTU masalah yang berat anak saya kurang makan anak saya kurang jajan sekolah berhenti ada nggak 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 sanggup nggak ada sanggupnya nggak sekolah kan gitu kan barang ini sekarang susah apalagi bukur itu kan tahu kan ikan mati di darat tadi tuh gitu itu berarti semalaman keluar tuh lebih banyak kalau malam keluar tuh ada yang mati ikannya siangnya tuh nggak kuat panas terus itu kan di, di orang ujur gatel 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 tuh ya, itu ada apa namanya yang seperti batu baru tuh hitam 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 gitu tanah sendiri sini sampai garam itu yang didudukin PLTU garam saya di situ ada yang sebelah sini ada yang sebelah sana gitu. posisinya saya yang pertama ya pak yang pertama udah dikurung ini jalan ini tanah saya ini jalan ini tanah saya pinggir jalannya jalan pertama tuh pak jalan pertama pertama temennya ribut aja ada yang kalau tidak dikasihkan nanti ada apa-apa ditakut-takutin pak malam-malam masuk ke rumah ditakut lagi kayak gitu pak jadi Bu Sawaraya tuh bilangnya tuh tidak beres nih jadi perhargaan tuh berarti apa ya namanya terpaksa paksaan iya saya juga takut-takuti namanya itu lain-lainnya udah dijual ya sudah kasih dikasihkan Ini kan pakai batu bara. Oh, yang PLTU satu aja kadang-kadang kalau ngebuang asap yang ke sini, apalagi ini kan dekat, apa apalagi misalkan itu anginnya dari angin laut.
Iya. Menolak sebenarnya Pak kalau ada PLTU cuma kan kalau rakyat kecil kan bagaimana? Terima aja rakyat kecil. Iya ya. Urusannya kalau sama pemerintah, kalau pemerintah susah Pak. Ya, lain sebenarnya kalau masalah keluhan itu banyak setelah adanya ada pengembangan PLTU Cirebon 2 ini. Contoh yang awalnya nelayan, khususnya nelayan kerambak kerang hijau, bisa mengab apa, menghabiskan 5 liter BBM jenis selar. Untuk sekarang itu bisa mencapai 10 sampai 12 liter. Nah itu akibat eh, lahan yang diambil oleh pengembang. Karena sebagian lahan yang yang dulunya dimanfaatkan oleh petani kerambak kerang hijau sekarang kan diambil sama sama si pengembang perusahaan. Di situ sebenarnya si pengembang itu sudah merugikan masyarakat secara tidak langsung. Nah, <tuh> bahkan kalau kita meng, kalau kita merasakan dengan kegagalan yang sekarang ini gagal panen itu sangat luar biasa sebenarnya. Jadi airnya merah, debunya, kalau musim panas, mana-mana, dulu sekali cuma diganti rugi tuh, uh, garam-garam merah semua, terus nggak ada kesininya tuh, nggak tahu gimana. Enggak, nggak setuju saya itu. Nggak setuju ada? Enggak, kepengennya tuh ya seperti dulu, seperti dulu lagi, lautnya. Sebelum ada PLTU itu di wilayah PLTU 1 saya tuh mencarikan di pinggiran pantai PLTU 1. Sekarang udah ada PLTU, berdirinya PLTU itu udah berkurang. Udah berkurang kita mencari ikan atau mata pencahariannya tuh udah berkurang, udah nggak ada. Dan kita pindah ke timur. Sedangkan di sebelah timur PLTU 1 ada pembangunan PLTU 2. Dan saat ini saya tidak bisa mencari ikan seperti dulu. Jadi saya ganti profesi. 
Dan saya sekarang mewakili nelayan-nelayan pinggiran mengenai gugatan hukum ke PLTU 2. Ya, mengenai gugatan hukum itu mengenai izin lingkungan dan dampak-dampak dari batu bara. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Your Honor, for this opportunity to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Meiki. I work uh, in the, one of the biggest environment organization called Walhi. My working area in West Java. We also uh, assisting the community impacted by the coal power plant. Uh, one and also the expansion of unit uh, two that uh, there there is a ing involvement on the financing as we watched before from the short movie that is the evidence that uh, describing how the community getting uh, suffer uh, because of the impact of the unit one that already uh, existing since uh, 2010 and then uh, become uh, their life become more uh, bad uh, after the government uh, 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 adding more uh, coal power plan uh, unit two as uh, expansions from the unit one uh, I just want to explain and adding uh, something more about uh, the impact uh, actually, uh, there is uh, there are the uh, small fishermen that actually impact and lost their job. That some of them uh, are uh, women, some of them are the mothers, some of them, several of them also are single parents who depending uh, their life on to collecting a small clam, small shell. Uh, around the uh, coastal area near the coal power plant unit one and unit two and uh, because of the projects of the unit one and the impact from the uh, unit two wastewater the water uh, quality the ecosystem become damaged and they no longer can have or can collecting uh, the uh, small shell, uh, uh, small clam that they uh, can uh, sell to the community around their uh, their village. Yeah. Uh, so now, uh, just to survive, uh, the women, the mothers, the small uh, fishermen have uh, they have to move from the first area, uh, uh, getting more far. 10 kilometers away from the first area. Yeah. The first area that uh, now uh, become a uh, unit one, a coal power plant unit one and unit two, uh, actually is uh, near their village. So if now they have to move away 10 kilometers, uh, of course, it will increase their operational cost. They need to uh, expands the transportation that uh, before the uh, ec uh, coal power plant exists, they just walking from their house to the coastal area. So no no cost that uh, they have to to pay. pay yeah? Uh, yeah. So uh, it also impact to the uh, because of the land use change that it used to be uh, just like we have. Uh, watch 
the, the area is used to be a uh, salt pond and also the farming area, paddy field. And now uh, it impact to the uh, hundreds of the salt pond worker getting uh, no job because uh, the land already used become a, a coal uh, a power plant. And uh, we also want to explain that uh, there is a case of uh, bribery, bribery, corruption. Yeah, when the one of the uh, sub constructions uh, company uh, they uh, bribing the former uh, Cherubon region, and the case uh, now is still being investigating by the Indonesian uh, corruption eradication. So we, uh, even though the case is uh, slow to be investigated. And until now, uh, uh, we also uh, uh, worried and waiting for the progress, but we still uh, follow up. We still uh, push the uh, Indonesian corruption eradication to speed up, to accelerate their investigating. But uh, as we know, uh, the construction subcontractor company already admitted that uh, they did uh, one of them uh, of their manager uh, general manager uh, give bribery bribery to the former uh, region it means there's we want to say yeah there are uh, many impacts uh, uh, that uh, already happened in this uh, project yeah that also uh, it means ing uh, have to look at it look at the case and look at all of the impact and take uh, responsibility for all that already happened uh, in the community and also uh, in the uh, project uh, itself so uh, our uh, uh, on behalf of the community, uh, we want to uh, demand that uh, ING is should be to uh, stop continuing Cherubon coal power plant project, and ING uh, should to withdraw all the financing uh, of the project, stop financing dirty coal, and stop becoming climate crime. Uh, that's it from uh, me on behalf of community, Your Honor. Uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity uh, to us to show all of the uh, evidence. Thank you so much. Thank you for your uh, testimony today, Mikey. Uh, and I'm sure that there will be many questions put to you by the judges as well as the jury here. So may I now ask the judges if they have any questions for Mikey? Yeah. So thank you very much, uh, Mikey, for the presentation and also the evidence that you share with us. I want to uh, start by asking um, a very direct question. Uh, ING is heavily invested, uh, as we saw in data presented. Those numbers are very big, even relative to Java and Indonesia's gross domestic product. Yeah. Yes. So was there consultation by ING with the peoples of Indonesia, peoples of Java, and the peoples of the villages that are affected by the project itself? So you mentioned in your introduction, you are part of an environmental group and part of yep. Friends of the Earth. So was there any ING work done on a local environmental assessment? And the last one uh, for now, was there any work done with the participation of ING in exploring what the ecological impact of 
funding such a project would be. Okay, yeah. Uh, so let me exp uh, explain. In our regulation, Indonesian uh, regulation, uh, uh, the company who will build, uh, let's say, who will build the uh, coal power plant, they have to uh, to prepare or to have a, a environmental impact assessment document. So, based on our experience, and also we already uh, interview to the community uh, affected community. There is no uh, socialization and call, uh, yeah, uh, such of also public consultation uh, that it uh, came from the ING. The it's usually the socialization or even uh, the public consultation is being set up or. Uh, 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 it uh, it doing by the company who will build, not by the supporter or the sponsor or the or the invest invest uh, investment investor. So uh, it happened on it uh, the socialization and and all of the uh, 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 social and public consultation was done by the company the company's name is uh, uh, cherubon uh, energy uh, power and one uh, and the second uh, company is cherubon uh, energy prasarana so they are who uh, manage or set up the uh, the socialization and public consultation so uh it's usually the sponsor yeah uh, or even uh, uh beside the ing let's say uh just like marubeni also not uh they didn't uh, take a uh, socialization so, so so that that i can explain so uh, i have one small one yeah, no, can I just ask one oh. clarify? So are you saying, I, we want to be clear on this, Mikey, are you saying that Cerebon power plant, the coal power plant, and the social and environmental impact assessment was done by another Cerebon consult uh, consultant? So Cerebon fire plant, uh, the, the uh, social and ecological impact of the coal plant, the assessment of the impact was done by a consulting firm that was related to the same company? Yes. Both yeah. are Cerebon. Yeah. So both of Cerebon. So the, the company in our regulation, the company uh, can hire consultant if they cannot or if the company don't have ability to set up uh, to do the study gitu. so in our regulation in uh, the company uh, have permission to hire a kind of a consultant to uh, and uh, to do the research for uh, EIA uh, document Thank you for that, Mike. Uh, thanks for clarifying that as well. Uh, the second point I want to raise, uh, also for, for your uh, sharing with us, please. From what I hear you say, the expansion from the first power plant to the second power plant yep. happened after the first power plant is established. You mentioned yep. 2010. Yep. Yes. So already yep. some impacts were being felt. This is not... Uh, a maths exercise, real people were being affected by power plant one. But the expansion to power plant two took place after these impacts were already being felt. Well, yeah. And we saw some level of protest uh, in the uh, video evidence you shared with us. Yeah. Did yeah. ING respond as a funder of the project to real people's protests 
that impacted on their livelihoods, but more importantly, on their lives. No, so far that we do the advocacy, yeah, uh, there is no uh, response from the ING uh, acting or uh, they, they respond with all of the uh, chaos, all of the impact uh, that happened in uh, because of the uh, Chirobone uh, Unit 1 and also the Expansion Unit 2. Uh, especially, uh, sorry, actually we, uh, with the coalition, send a complaint letter, complaint letter to uh, IG, uh, ING in 2015 and to, uh, 2000. Uh, 17 and the third one the 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 update one is uh, we send again uh, our letter complaint letter in april uh, 2020 21 sorry 21 but until now we have uh, no uh, answers no answers uh, with uh, uh, our uh, letter so uh, i conclude that there is no uh, response yeah, from the ING uh, itself. Uh, I remember, sorry, clarify, the second uh, letter, uh, ING uh, respond us, but the answer is not satisfying that, uh, that we know our demand and at least the, the, the complaint or the explanation that we want to uh, ing to responsibility uh, to take responsible to uh, 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 to uh, for all of the impact uh, there is no uh, reaction there is no implementation uh, from the uh, ing okay. was there any other question yes mickey thank you very very much for that um, very very good and clear presentation I've got about three questions. Uh, <clears throat> the first one is, um, does ING have a policy uh, of banning investments in coal? Did, did ING ever, I mean, it's my understanding that they may have introduced a policy of not investing in coal. Is that correct? Yeah, based on uh, information from uh, our uh, network, uh, ING tight, tightening uh, its call policy in July 2017. Yeah, uh, uh, ING stop, will stop financing of another new coal power uh, station. Yeah, but uh, ING. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, still continuing the financing on the coal power plant uh, in Cirebon, despite the so, protests from the local population, repeat, uh, complaint against ING from Indonesian, uh, also from the Indonesian NGOs. It continued to finance Cirebon even after it had said it wasn't yeah. going to finance any more coal. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. The second question I have is, um, uh, have any of the other banks that are in the consortium of banks that ING put together to finance Cerebon, have any of them withdrawn from the project? No, there is no uh, other banks who are involved in the Cerebon financing. Uh, is it is it correct that 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 Credit Agricole has withdrawn its financing? Oh yes, yeah, yeah. Only uh, Credit Agricole uh, who withdraw their financing. So another bank ha yeah. that was involved has withdrawn its financing. Uh, uh, I beg your pardon. Sorry. So another bank that was involved in the project has withdrawn yeah. its financing, has stopped financing. No, no. Credit Agricole has stopped financing? Yeah, only Credit Agricole. Okay. But uh, 
ING and then uh, uh, JB, uh, they still keep on going, keep continuing the financing. Okay, so uh, um, I'd like to ask you also a, a one question. Um, my understanding is that ING says that it has social and environmental principles and it adheres to something called the equator principles. Now, my understanding is that uh, your, your coalition of groups that are opposed to Cerebon detailed that there were some 65 violations of this set of principles that the bank signs up to, and that you informed um, ING of those. Have they ever responded in detail to your, um, your documentation of the violations of the equator principles? We, uh, yeah, we, we are not uh, in detail comparing to the uh, equator uh, principle. We just, uh, we only uh, explain and then uh, uh, tell them from our letter that uh, the impact is, uh, the project is impacted, imp uh, gave impact to the uh, fishermen, for example, for fishermen, fisher folk, and also the farmers, uh, salt maker, and, uh, and uh, also the environment, uh, for, for example, the seawater quality ecosystem and uh, also uh, for the last one we mentioned about uh, bribery but you have corruption. you haven't received detailed responses to the your complaints from yes. ing okay and yeah. I, I i just want to ask two questions very quickly on the role of the dutch state um, could you tell me whether you know whether or not the Dutch state is investigating the allegations of corruption? Has there been any action by the Dutch state to investigate the corruption? Alleged corruption? No, there is no, okay. there is no action of investigation. And in your view, would it be open to the Dutch state, should the Dutch state have banned uh, Dutch companies from investing in coal when it was first aware that coal was so damaging to climate but also to the environment and to people? Should it have banned? Yes. Okay. But it hasn't. Yes. But it hasn't yeah, taken any exactly. action. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. You're welcome, sir. My pleasure. Okay. Um, Members of the jury, do you have any questions for Mikey? Do you have? Hi, Mikey. Um, thank you for your presentation. I think we have many similarities in the case exposed today. I would like to ask you specifically about the second phase of the project. Are you aware of the date of the negotiations for the plant expansion? Uh, was it named uh, as the project's second phase or the project's expansion? I, I ask that because you mentioned uh, construction companies' bribery and was there uh, an addition to the contract or the construction contract, the civil works, or was there uh, the end of the first project's contract and then they assumed a second multi-million project that was already being um, questioned on many grounds. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm so, uh, so sorry. I can. Uh, I, uh, I still can get the the, the question. I'm I'm so sorry. I think so, the question I is. Can it, yeah. I think the question is the Cerebon One project yeah. 
Was there a separate contract for Cerebon 1 and a separate contract for Cerebon 2? Or was Cerebon 2 part of the first contract as an expansion? Was there only one contract for both projects or were there two separate contracts? Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, Cerebon, uh, actually Cerebon 1 and the expansion Cerebon Unit 2 uh, is separate contract, separate contract and uh, uh, that's why the operator company, the company operator uh, uh, that will be operate the uh, call power open also different, not uh, with the same name of the company yeah gitu. so it's a uh, separate the contract is uh, different between uh, one and uh, unit uh, two gitu. so the same financiers but two different contracts two different companies yeah two different companies uh, even though the person who in charge in this company is came from uh, uh, the same group, the same group. Uh, thank you for that. Was there any other? Yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I just like to know what is the human cost of the struggle? The human cost, you've not spoken about the people who are dying because the, of the impact of the project and how have the human rights defenders protected themselves because I've seen protests, the exposure, political exposure and risk is too high. Are there people dying in the course of advocating for your cause, and how do you ensure that the human rights defenders are protected? Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we also uh, understand. Yeah, we, we actually uh, aware and understand that uh, uh, there is a risk since. Uh, uh, the community uh, also experiencing that they uh, got uh, kind of uh, intimidation when the first, just like uh, uh, we watched from the movie, one of the uh, fishermen uh, uh, filing the lawsuit. And then after that, uh, the community uh, who become as a representative, as a plaintiff, they got uh, kind of uh, 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 intimidation. Yeah? Intimidation, uh, for, for, for example, uh, uh, if they didn't, if they, if they are not uh, revoke their uh, lawsuit, so the company will uh, lawsuit back them. Yeah. Be, uh, so uh, that's uh, based on. Uh, their uh, our plaintiff plaintiff testimony to us. So uh, yeah, uh, uh, basically we uh, we don't have kind of uh, uh, we have tightened our security uh, uh, procedure. Yeah, uh, so we uh uh kind of uh, we uh, make uh, uh we often uh, make a kind of a, a phone call to to monitoring the uh, uh the community who become uh, as a, a, a plaintiff so and then also we are back up we got the backup from the our colleagues from the uh, legal aid uh, organization just for uh, in uh, just in case if uh, there is uh, something happen if uh, there is kind of a, uh, uh, arrested uh, for example arrested or the uh, uh, others uh, intimidation 
that uh, it uh, that we feel it already threatened uh, the community or also including us as a as a community organizer uh, uh, about uh, uh, our and the community security uh, i think that's it that i can uh, explain thank you mm -hmm. sharon did you want Oh, thank you very much for your presentation. I wasn't going to ask a question, but just your recent statements leads me to ask a question. Who's benefiting from the coal plants? Where is the, coal, where is the energy going to? What is, it, what, is it, what is it being used for? Like they're, they're, creating, they're creating this electricity, but what, what purpose? It's not, yeah. benefit, uh, it's not benefiting the, the government. fishermen. Yeah, yeah, government yeah. said the government said the the needs of and also the 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 adding of the, uh, the coal power plant unit uh, around, uh, for example, uh, in the uh, Java Island, whole the Java Island, is to increase the economic development. Yeah, but uh, it uh, actually we. Based on our view, the electricity needs from the coal power plant, it will be uh, supply the industrial area that, that the government uh, has been planning. So uh, we can say the actually the uh, electricity uh, will be more uh, used by the industrial not for the people yeah okay i just because, have one uh, be, because uh, we ever have uh, experience when we uh, live in the, in the community there is a kind of uh, 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 there is no the we have experience when the electricity getting stopped in 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 this in the village that we doing the advocacy near the coal power plant so it's uh, it it's it's uh, how to say so the village that near the coal power plant they having experience uh, uh, of uh, no electricity getting shut down even though only one day yeah but for me it's yeah it, uh, yeah for us uh, uh, that we we feel the experience it's uh, how to say yeah it's it's uh, bad experience yeah when uh, uh, the the village near the uh, coal power plant or or the power near the uh, power infrastructure, but uh, the elec their electricity needs is still not uh, sustained. That we uh, that is uh, I can explain. I just have one other question. Do you know where the coal is coming from that they're burning in that plant? From the Kalimantan, yeah, Kalimantan region, from the Kalimantan regions, from the mining, the coal mining in mostly in Kalimantan, in Borneo, in Borneo Island. Okay, thank you very much. Mikey, thank you, but I will just ask one more concluding question to round off the last two questions. Mm -hmm. You said that the power produced in the power plant goes to the industries and there is an industrial area established by the government. Can you say something about the goods that are produced in that industrial area? Are they produced for export or are they produced for local consumption? Who benefits from that industrial production? Uh, 
Yeah, based okay. on we we knew uh, the industrial the government uh, push the industrial to have to to have the production for uh, export needs. Yeah, because the uh, in Java Island, in government have a planning Java Island as a, as a center of the industrial no longer as a farming farming uh, sector but uh, government have a planning uh, java island become as a center of the industrial so uh, it will be develop uh, many our uh, industrial area in all of the province in java island including also in uh, west java uh, it will the, uh, it will be uh, four industrial area uh, uh, from in the north in the in the north of uh, west java in uh, west east and south so it will be, so we conclude that the electricity uh, will be supply to the uh, this industrial uh, area and uh, do you have any idea of the countries to which these goods are exported what are the countries to which this industrial production goes to where is it exported yeah, uh, we don't yeah we still don't have uh, information about that all right um thank you very much thank you very much for your contributions thank you and uh, we will uh, consider all the evidence thank you. Thank you. i will now call upon the defendants for the ing group stephen Juan Rich, how do you how do you pronounce Rizvak, Chief Executive Officer of the ING Group. If you are here, or if there is anybody else who wishes to represent the ING, could you please come forward and present your defence? Is there anybody for the ING group? They have all been served, members of the jury. I must tell you that they have been served with the summons and with the charge sheet. So if you are here, please present your defense here. Is there anyone for the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate who wishes to say anything in defense after hearing the evidence? If not, I will now hand you over to the clerk of the court who will explain the rest of the proceedings. Thank you. I then declare the uh, court will now be in uh, recess for 20 minutes before we continue with the second charge concerning commerce past, present and future in Cameroon versus uh, ING Group and the Dutch state. And we will reconvene at five past three. We reconvene at five past three. Thank you.
Welcome everyone. The court is now back in session. Chairing judge is Rade de Souza. Judges Sharon H. Venn, Rasihan Maharaj, Nicolas Hildyard. The court also wishes to welcome all jury members that have uh, joined in this second part of the session. Thank you for um, taking part in this collective hearing and collective validation of uh, various witness testimonies that you will be hearing today before um, passing out your collective verdict. I pass the word now to Chairing Judge Rada de Souza. Thank you very much. Um, we are about to hear our second witness for the day. May I now call upon the clerk of the court to read the charges, please. Thank you. Uh, for those jury members that have just uh, joined uh, in the file that was placed on your seat, you will find this charge sheet with the three accusations that we will be um, hearing today. And we will move now to the second charge, and that is the second charge concerning comrades past, present and future in Cameroon. The charge reads as following, point one, that around 2010, through financial arrangements, the ING group created an extended family of artificial persons belonging to multiple nationalities, amongst them those named Sokfin, Sokfin Asia, Sokfin Af, Sokapalm, SPFC, and concealed the fact that they were members of the same extended family under the financial control and authority of the ING group, acting as the patriarch with the ma malicious intention of grabbing water, gra grabbing land, water, forests, and labors that belong to humans and non-humans in the Cameroon. Second, that the state of the Netherlands, acting through the World Trade Organization, coerced the state of Cameroon to allow the ING group to enter Cameroon and occupy lands and establish palm oil plantations for its own benefit and that of the ING group. Three, that empowered by the state of the Netherlands, the ING group aided, abetted, incited and financed Sokfin to forcibly confiscate lands, evict people from land and establish palm oil plantations in order to profit from it. Four, that Sokfin and Sokapalm, both members of the extended family of artificial persons created by the ING group, formed armed militia to terrorize people, sexually violate women and forcibly evict people from their lands which they had inherited from their ancestors. Five, that the palm oil plantations funded by the ING group and executed by the extended family of artificial persons created by it, destroyed forests, homelands for many species, polluted the waters, deprived humans and non-humans of drinking water, their sources of life and livelihoods and violated the interdependent relationships between humans and non-humans on the confiscated lands with lasting impacts on future generations. These activities if proved to be true, constitute intergenerational climate crimes against past, present and future generations of humans, non-humans, cultures and ecosystems in, in, in Cameroon under, the, under Section 3, A, B, C and D of the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act. I will now call upon our second witness, our second witness to uh, is Emmanuel Ilong, President of Synergy National de Paisans e Reverians to Cameroon, or Sina Parsam. And uh, I will call upon Emmanuel to present his uh, evidence in support of the charges. Uh, the witnesses have made a video for us, which we will watch. I must also remind the jury that the video that you watched in the morning and the one that you are about to watch now, they were all made by the witnesses, especially for these proceedings. Um, and the music video, the music in this video is by the late Cameroonian musician Claude Nadam, who was a peace activist and promoter of national culture from the Noon Division in the Western region of Cameroon. Both the video and the witness will be translated by our translator, Sonia Conchon. And I am very grateful for the translation here. And uh, 
the question and answers, the questions by judges and by the jury will also be translated. Thank you. Here in this place, men and women have gathered fish killed by pollution. The river was flowing here. It is li like this now because of soca bomb and its pollution. The trees here used to be underwater. With uh, climate change this year, not only did the water not rise, but there is also no fish, nothing. You see the net behind me. People leave it here for the whole week, for five days, and they don't catch a single fry. We have all realized that here, where those big agro-industries surround us. People have removed sand in the mouth of the river up to a certain level, about two years ago. So here you see at the dry season it was four meter deep, and in the rain season it was more than 20 meter deep. And unfortunately this year there is no water. We managed to speak today about climate change in Cameroon. It, it has effect on small-scale agriculture, which is impacted by the establishment of big industrial corporations. They are grow growing rubber trees, palm trees for oil, bananas as well. In our area, more precisely on the coast, we have big industrial corporations such as Socapalm, Socfin Bolloré, the CDC, Cameroon Development Corporation, and the PHP that has drained all swamps. Water does not rise anymore here to the shallow parts. Today this has a very negative impact. The forest is gone. The animals are gone, they drain all swamps, and even the water doesn't rise anymore. So today we tell ourselves the impact of climate change is caused by the establishment of these corporations. So they are doing work here, they are planting the young palm trees. It is very recent work. Look at the earth. Yeah, they're planting young palm trees. Of course it has an impact. You see, we live along the river. We rely a lot on fishing. We can't fish anymore since fish have disappeared. Water that is supposed to rise to bring fish is not rising anymore. This is the impact on our way of life, on our life. Change. 
Things have changed since large corporations like Soka Palm came and removed all the forests. The production isn't good anymore. We don't know. We try to work hard, but it doesn't give much. We try to follow the crop calendar, it doesn't give much either. When we wait uh, for the rain, it does not come. Rain comes when we don't need it. All these changes are worrying us. We are fearful, fearful for the next generation because we have known floods during the raining season. And unfortunately, the next generation, they won't see that any anymore. Maybe our grandchildren won't even know that there was such thing. So this is the alarm call, or the me message we pass on to our children and grandchildren. Our river, the Mongo, and our river mouth, that everyone knows, it will soon disappear. Dutch Bank ING is one of the main funders of Sokfin, parent company of Sokapalm. This is a crime for the future generation. They won't manage to harvest from the forest. Since the forest is gone, they won't catch fish because water doesn't rise anymore. They won't hunt game because the forest is gone. We are asking the entire world to try to regulate all this. Seeing how the forest of the Gulf of Guinea is disappearing, we tell ourselves that the next generation will have nothing left. Oui, bonjour Emmanuel, vous pouvez commencer et vous pouvez présenter vos camarades. Je suis Emmanuel Pelot, président de l'association des paysans et riverains du Cameroun. C'est une association qui défend les droits et les intérêts des communautés riveraines des agro-industries et multinationales installées au Cameroun. Hello, my in both. My name is uh, Emmanuel Elong. I am the president of the association Sina Parkam. Uh, it is an organization that defends the rights and the interests of the people who live along the uh, um, along the river and uh, close to the agro industries. Je suis accompagné avec Monsieur Josué Dendele, qui est le chargé de communication de notre association. I am. Et Mademoiselle. Olga Dika, qui est la secrétaire de l'antenne féminine de notre organisation. I am together today joined by Josué Idiendere, who is the communication officer of the SINAPARCAM, and Olga Dika, who is secretary of the women's branch of SINAPARCAM. Nous sommes fiers d'être avec vous aujourd'hui pour parler 
des non-conformités de la SOCAPAM vis-à-vis -vis des communautés riveraines. We are proud to be here today with you to talk about the issues of the SOCAPAM uh, relating to the communities here. Alors, nous avons présenté une mouture et des activités de SOCAPAM qui ont un impact très négatif sur nos vies. So we have presented uh, the activities uh, of Sokapam, which have a very negative impact on our lives here. We are ready to answer various questions asked in relationship to the short documentary movie you have just seen. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, we, will oui. first, we will first ask the judges if they have any questions for Emmanuel and his colleagues. Do you have? Yeah. Merci, Emmanuel. Nous, avons, nous allons tout d'abord demander aux juges s'ils ont des questions pour vous et pour vos collègues. No, no. Um, did you have any questions? <coughs> Thank you, Emmanuel. Are we being translated sentence at a time? You can speak in English. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Emmanuel. Um, and thank you for sharing with us the video. Merci beaucoup, Emmanuel, et merci pour avoir partagé cette vidéo. Um, I, I, I have a, some questions which I'd like to um, just get your view on. Um, ING states on its website that it doesn't finance um, palm oil plantation. It says that it only provides general finance or trade finance. Uh, how would you respond to that? Euh, J'ai une question pour vous. Euh, J'aimerais connaître votre opinion dessus. ING affirme sur son site internet qu'elle ne finance pas de palmeraie, euh, mais qu'elle ne fournit que des finances générales ou qu'elle finance le commerce. Quel est votre avis sur cela Notre avis par rapport à la question posée, c'est que ING finance ce qui et Sofine est la société mère de ce papa. Vous voyez donc que l'argent que ING donne à Sofine, sur une partie de cet argent, entre dans les activités de ce papa. Puisque quand nous eh, parlons des problèmes négatifs de ce papa, c'est Sofine qui réagit. So, our opinion is that ING finances Sofine. And Sokfin is the parent company of Sokapalm. So one part goes directly to Sokapalm. So could I just ask you to, to be clear? Would you say that ING's description of its involvement in palm oil and specifically Sokofin is evasive or misleading? Euh, pour être clair, est-ce que vous pourriez dire, est-ce que vous pourriez affirmer que, ING, que la description d'ING euh, par rapport à son implication euh, dans les palmeraies à huile est euh, mensongère ou en tout cas qu'elle évite le sujet Oui, exactement, l'ING évite le sujet parce que ce n'est pas la première fois qu'on dénonce euh, le soutien de l'ING à ce qui est la société mère de ce papa. Donc ils essayent d'éviter de dire que leur agent n'est pas dans les plantations de palmiers à huile ni de béa, mais leur agent est effectivement dans cette opération. Yes, precisely, they are evasive because this is not the first time that we are denouncing this this problem that the money going uh, from Sokfin goes to Soka Palm and therefore to palm palm trees and palm plantations. ING also says on its website that it only uh, provides this general finance to palm oil companies that undergo um, enhanced environmental and social due diligence. 
Ça, donc ING affirme aussi sur son site internet qu'elle ne finance seulement que des entreprises qui ont des critères de, de responsabilité sociale et qui suivent un processus de due, de due diligence. Not just due diligence, but enhanced due diligence. Euh, donc de due diligence euh, euh, améliorée, ou en tout cas un, un, un processus poussé. I'd like to ask you, it's my understanding that ING has been providing soccer fin, um, finance since at least 2010. How many visits to the community have you had from ING staff? What questions have they asked you? How have they conducted this enhanced due diligence? Uh, could you, sorry, could you please repeat the question a little bit slower, slower so I can translate yes, as I it goes? Okay, so let me do it in two parts. My understanding is that uh, ING has provided finance to Socafin since at least 2010. Now, what I'm trying to ask is if they are doing enhanced investigations into the uh, operations of uh, Bolero and Socafin, how many times has they visited the community? How many times have they asked them what the damages are? How many times have they um, sought to get an understanding from the community of any human rights abuses and so on? What, what, what is this, what is their experience of this enhanced due diligence? Donc, je comprends que ING a financé la SOCAPAM jusqu'à au moins 2010. Euh et que le et qu'elle dit et que ING dit qu'il y a des enquêtes poussées dans les opérations de Socfin. Euh, moi, j'aimerais connaître votre opinion. Combien de visites ont été euh, faites en, vers les communautés euh, Est-ce que les communautés ont été euh, ont été interrogées sur les dommages euh, qui, qui ont été euh, qui ont été faits euh, Est-ce qu'il y a eu vraiment un, un processus de due diligence poussé Je vais répondre négativement qu'on n'a jamais vu les membres ou la délégation des DNG sur le terrain. Sophie Je vais donc. Ah, sorry. Oui. I will answer negatively to this question. We've never seen any delegation of ING on the terrain. Thank you. That's, Et... that's all my question. Could... Et... Si je peux ajouter quelque chose, Sophie a prend des engagements qu'elle n'a jamais respectés. Sophie dit zéro déforestation, euh, mécanisme de gestion de plaintes, jamais n'est appliqué sur le terrain, parce que Sophie a des méthodes que nous, on ne maîtrise pas. Sophie peut dire qu'il y a les équipes de sur le terrain. Un, un, instant, les équipes... Je... un instant, Emmanuel, je vais traduire. Um, so, Sockfins uh, say things that they actually never respected. For example, one of their uh, saying is that they would do zero deforestation, and of course, they do it. Uh, so, they follow methods which are not transparent. And I have one et, last question. Sorry. Sophie a des visites orientées pour ceux qui sont favorables à leur méthode. Sophie a travail avec, prépare les gens pour répondre aux questions, pour satisfaire leurs demandes. Donc, s'il peut y avoir des agents de DNG sur le terrain, nous qui dénonçons les méthodes de travail de Sophie, on ne peut pas les voir. So, um... Sockfin also organizes visits uh, that are directed to people who are favorable to their methods. So, for example, if agents of ENG were coming to the field, we would not be able to talk to them because we're not fav favorable to their methods. Okay. I have a, one last question. <coughs> ING is a Dutch bank. What, in your opinion, should the Dutch government have done to prevent the abuses that you have documented on the ground? Uh, ING is a bank Netherlands. Selon vous, what should the government of Netherlands have done to prevent the abuses that you have documented on the ground? Yes, the Dutch government has done the ING to 
fait une étude sur le terrain pour recenser les dommages que eh, Sophie nous a posés à travers sa filiale sur la banque. Et de stopper le financement de Sophie. So the Dutch government should push ANG to conduct a study on the field to see the damages from Sockfin that were created through its uh, company Socapalm. And it should also stop the financing. And in the absence of the Dutch government doing that, do you believe that they are complicit in the abuses that you are suffering? Si le, le gouvernement néerlandais ne fait rien, est-ce que vous considérez qu'il est complice de ce qu'il vous arrive Oui, on va considérer cela parce que Sokapan, Sophie voulait développer une plantation dans le département du Cap et il devait avoir le financement de la Banque mondiale. Nous, on a écrit à la Banque mondiale en, en doucement. Ils ont arrêté de ne pas donner le prêt à Sophie. Yeah. Um, yes, because Sockfin wanted to develop uh, plantations here with the finances of the World Bank. Uh, and we have contacted the uh, Ombudsman from the World Bank. Uh, Pouvez-vous répéter, Emmanuel, simplement la dernière partie? Yeah, on, a, on a contacté le département Ombudsman de la Banque mondiale. Mm -hmm. On a des problèmes et ils n'ont pas financé ce développement de plantations à Yabassi. After we contacted the Obnusman, they didn't finance the plantation. So the World Bank withdrew its financing or didn't, pro didn't provide financing? Donc, uh, they didn't provide fi finances. And so the Dutch government should do the same and, and force the ING to stop financing. Et donc le gouvernement néerlandais devrait faire la même chose et arrêter euh, euh, ING de financer ce qu'il se passe sur le terrain. Oui, puisque j'ai d'abord dit qu'ils doivent faire l'audit des dommages causés aux populations, s'ils peuvent réparer et mettre une politique de suivi, on peut les financer. So first, they should conduct an audit on the damages caused to the population, and if they can repair the harm done, then that would work. Many thanks. Thank you. Merci bien, Emmanuel. Merci aussi. Thank you. Too. Uh, thank you very much, Emmanuel, and greetings to the colleagues as well. Merci beaucoup, Emmanuel, et uh, mes salutations à vos collègues. I want to uh, ask uh, two questions. Hmm? Je voudrais poser deux questions. Have you seen ING in Cameroon? Avez-vous vu ING au Cameroun? Je dis non. On n'a jamais vu ING sur le terrain. Nous qui dénonçons les problèmes sur Capa, on ne peut pas les accompagner chez nous parce qu'on va parler du négatif. So I said, no, we've never seen ING on the field here because us, the people who are denouncing the problems of Soka Palm, we don't have access to those people. So, have you seen the Dutch government in Cameroon is their embassy. Et avez-vous vu le gouvernement néerlandais au Cameroun ou leur ambassade ou leur ambassade? Non. On n'a pas eu poussé pour atteindre ces gens-là, c'est pas facile. No, we cannot uh, reach those people. This is not easy. Uh, merci. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and good afternoon to everybody. I wanted to ask a question about, you said something about that you didn't, you wanted the planting to stop. How long would it take to recover the forest if, if they stopped the planting now? Merci. Uh, je voudrais poser une question. Uh, vous avez dit que vous souhaiteriez que les plantations de, de, de palmiers à l'huile stop, uh, s'arrêtent maintenant. Combien de temps pensez-vous qu'il faudrait pour que la forêt revienne et pour oh. réparer les dommages Si c'est moi, ce n'est pas stopper la plantation de palmiers à l'huile, stopper eh, les extensions. Mais je disais que l'IMG ne doit pas stopper à financer ce prix. 
So I didn't say that I would want to stop the full plantation, but we want to stop the expansion of it and we want to stop ING to finance this. But you're, <clears throat> you're, you're not opposed to the plantation being there? Mais or, vous, vous I'm not, I'm confused. Mais vous n'êtes pas opposé à la présence de ces plantations? Je ne suis pas sûr. Non, on est opposé à la présence de ces plantations puisque Sophie ne respecte pas les accords signés avec l'État du Cameroun. So Sophie we, doit retrouver. Oui, uh, we are opposed against this plantation because our when Sokfin doesn't respect the agreements made with the state of Cameroon. Okay. Parce Go ahead. Because, because the state of Cameroon has asked Sokfin to give back some land to the community. For agriculture familiar. For small scale family farming. Can I ask a, another small question? How does this affect your children? What has happened on the land? Uh, J'aimerais poser une autre question. Uh, de quelle manière cela affecte-t-il vos enfants uh, et ça, les terres? Ça, ça affecte nos enfants puisque on manque de l'espace vital pour euh, faire de l'agriculture ou pour construire des maisons. Et... So it affects our children because we lack vital space, not, not only to farm, but also to build houses. Because part of our, our, our work here is to think about the future generations. And it concerns me that the future generations is very bleak for them now. Notre travail ici est de penser aux générations futures et je suis très inquiète parce que l'avenir semble assez sombre pour, euh, pour les futures générations. Oui, l'avenir est vraiment sombre, puisque même les bas-fonds qui euh, nous restaient, Sophie est en train de les drainer pour faire euh, des extensions. Yes, the future is very, very bleak for the future generation, especially with those expansions from Sophie. Thank, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Merci beaucoup. Emmanuel, I want, would like a clarification from you. You said that the government of Cameroon asked Sokfin to return the land to the communities for family farming. Um, what happened to that uh, agreement? J'aimerais une clarification de votre part, Emmanuel. Vous dites que le gouvernement de, du Cameroun a demandé à Sokfin de rendre des terres euh, aux communautés pour pouvoir euh, pratiquer une agriculture familiale. Qu'en est-il Que s'est-il passé Oui, puisque euh, la Socafam était une société d'État. Et so en 2000, euh, Sokfin a racheté la Socafam. So Soka Palm was a state-owned company, and in 2000, it was bought back by Sokfin. So when, this, when the signature of this deal was done, the state concluded that mistakes were done because some lands were grabbed from the communities, so they should be given back. And now Sokfin still uses these spaces and they keep on doing expansions, including on shallow parts of the swamp. So that's why we say they keep on grabbing land. So we also have uh, religious spaces. Uh, our graveyard are still actually buried deep under uh, some plantations, and we don't have access to that. 
they've been destroyed in uh, 1968, and we still don't have access to these religious spaces or cultural spaces. Alors que euh, les organisations de, de régulation comme RSPV, comme euh, euh, ICV, High Carbon Stock Value, comme ça là, interdisent ça, mais ils continuent à pratiquer euh, l'agriculture là-dessus. Uh, we know that regulation organizations such as RSPO are actually forbidding this type of, of things, but they keep on farming, uh, they keep on having those plantations on these lands, on these sacred lands for us. Okay, um, thank you very much, Emmanuel. I have uh, one, uh, I will now ask members of the jury if they have any questions for Emmanuel and his comrades. Anyone in the jury? Merci Emmanuel. Je vais maintenant demander aux membres du jury s'il y a des questions pour vous et pour vos camarades. Any questions? Uh, thank you for your testimony. I would like to ask uh, in regard to intergenerational harm, not just intergenerational harm for the future, but also intergenerational harm of the past. I'll let you translate this first and continue with my question. Uh, merci pour votre témoignage. J'ai une question par rapport aux dommages intergénérationnels. Pas seulement les dommages intergéné intergénérationnels pour les générations futures, mais aussi par rapport au passé. Um, as I'm familiar with the colonization through plantations of palm oil of um, Belgium in particular uh, under Leopold and the land grabs, the human rights violation, the genocide and the ecocide that has taken place in the past. Um, and I would like to call it into our discussion today as it um, reaffirms a pattern of wrongdoing that is in line with um, colonial uh, loss and damages to the peoples um, in different places in Africa. Um, par rapport au... <coughs> uh, pardon. Je suis assez familière, en fait, des, des problèmes de, de colonisation uh, à travers uh, la plantation des palmiers. Uh, de tout ce qui s'est passé sous le règne de Léopold, de l'accaparement des terres, des génocides. Uh, il s'agit d'un schéma que l'on voit de méfaits uh, qui s'inscrivent dans la ligne de la colonisation. My question is about human rights violations, as we have read in the charges, um, the intimidation of people who are land defending. Um, And if you see... Um, one moment, please. Uh, ma question concerne la violation des droits humains. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. L'intimidation, pardon, des défenseurs, euh, des défenseurs des droits humains. And if you can elaborate on um, how violence against land defenders is in line with um, colonial um, power dynamics and colonial harm, in this case in Cameroon. Uh, Pouvez-vous préciser comment uh, les violences qui sont commises contre les défenseurs des terres uh, s'inscrivent uh, dans ces rapports coloniaux et ces rapports violents uh, que l'on voit au Cameroun. And to close, um, when we talk about loss and damages, what kind of reparations are in need? Not just um, reparations to the land, but also reparations to the people. And with reparations, I don't just talk about money, but in terms of repairing community. Euh, en ce qui concerne les pertes et les dommages, quelles sont les réparations auxquelles on peut penser euh, Les réparations par rapport aux terres, par rapport aux gens euh, Je parle bien sûr, je parle d'argent, mais pas seulement. Euh, quel autre type de réparation, euh, à quel autre type de réparation peut-on penser Thank you. Merci. Je commence par la première question par rapport euh, à la violence faite aux aux défenseurs des droits de l'homme. Moi qui suis devant vous, je suis un défenseur des droits des communautés. On a signé aux droits de l'homme. 
Nous sommes exposés à beaucoup de problèmes. So um, I will ask, I will first answer your question related to the violence to human rights defenders. I am myself a uh, human rights defenders and I am defending communities' rights. So these corporations are multinational corporations, uh, capitalist co corporations with huge means, and they are even above the leaders, the political leaders. Parce que nous subissons des intimidations de ces sociétés à travers nos autorités administratives. So we undergo intimidations from these corporations through our own administration. Parce que avec leur pouvoir économique, c'est eux qui dictent à nos autorités administratives quoi faire. Euh, pardon, pouvez-vous répéter? Euh, ces sociétés-là, avec leur pouvoir économique, c'est eux qui dictent à nos commandants de brigade, à nos commissaires et aux autorités administratives quoi faire pour, pour nous intimider. So these corporations with their economic power, they are dictating our administrative authorities. They are telling them what to do to intimidate us. So every day we are called to go to the police station. We are called to go to a uh, Um, administrative authorities and ask to stop our struggle, to stop the fight. So if you push through, if you continue, yes, it will be this way and you will have fines. Sont des alertes pour nous. Quand tu sors le matin, tu ne peux plus rentrer chez toi. La famille saisit l'ONG pour être dit que mon mari est parti, il n'est pas revenu. So if we are free today, it is. If we are free today, it is thanks to uh, human rights NGOs who are helping us because you're never sure when you come back to your family at night if it will be okay. Donc voilà où on dit que nous sommes exposés à des problèmes, nous défenseurs des droits de l'homme. So, we are definitely exposed to issues, we, the defenders of human rights. On ne doit pas se critiquer ce qui se passe sur le terrain. We are not supposed to criticize, to denounce what's happening on the terrain. Mais nous, nous pensons à rappeler la société alors que ce que tu fais n'est pas bon, il faut le faire comme ça. Là. Mais ils ne veulent pas qu'on parle de ça. So we want to denounce what's going on with the corporation, but they don't want us to, to do this. Si je peux aller à la deuxième question, la réparation que nous pouvons demander à ces sociétés, c'est que le cas de Sokapam, Sokapam a hérité So let's go to the second question when it comes to the repair. So Sokapom inherited a very heavy uh, inheritance uh, from the past. Because it's the state who has committed all these in the dictature. Because the state... Or person who could talk about something. Because the state uh, caused all this harm under dictatorship. Et aujourd'hui, l'État est ce capable que l'État a demandé de réparer, ne veut pas s'exécuter. Et l'État ne joue pas son rôle de gendarme. And today, the state has asked ce capable to repair damages, but it doesn't want to, and the state doesn't play its role of pushing ce capable to do so. La réparation que nous demandons, c'est la récupération d'une partie de nos terres. The repair we're asking for is to get back part of our lands. C'est de de dommager les pertes humaines que nous allons perdre parce que ce qui s'est passé dans les années 68, beaucoup de nos arrière-grands-parents sont morts parce que c'était un choc. 
So we are asking for the repair of human loss. What happened in 1968 is that many of our grandparents uh, died. The damage the plantation is done, the fleet, some pay and from. And we want the repair of all the plantation they also destroyed without paying one euro for that. Si je peux terminer comme réparation, c'est de nous accompagner dans les projets de développement pour uh, la ville. Uh, il y a eu une coupure uh, pour vous accompagner dans le développement pour que la Et ville. Nous avons des projets pour que ils viennent. The type, the type of repair we ask as well is for them to join us in development projects, that they come here in the communities to develop things on the terrain. Was that it? Voilà, la souffrance sur ta part. La souffrance via sur ta part. So... Euh, Est-ce que vous pouvez répéter Je... Ça coupe un petit peu la connexion. Voilà ce, voilà ce que nous réclamons à Sophie. So this is what we ask to the Sockfin, what we, what we demand Sockfin to do. Has he finished, Sonia Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, was there any other question? Y a-t-il d'autres questions? Can I ask a clarification, Emmanuel? Uh, Emmanuel, je voudrais demander une précision. Um, you said twice, once about uh, returning land to the communities. Uh, is that what you want? And have you asked have the communities demanded land redistribution? Uh, donc Emmanuel, vous avez parlé deux fois uh, du fait de rendre les terres aux communautés. Est-ce que c'est ce que vous voulez? Et avez-vous demandé aux communautés uh, quel type de redistribution des terres elles souhaitaient? Oui, toutes les communautés libérales de Sokapa, leur première revendication, c'est la récupération d'une partie de leurs terres. Et so, en fait. Yeah. All, for all the communities that are living around Sokapa implementation, their first claim is to get part of the land back. Thank you for Allez, that. Uh, there was maybe a second part. Allez-y, okay. Emmanuel. Oui, parce que même l'État du Cameroun a compris ça et a, a fait la réduction de la surface de Sokapa en 2005. Ils ont fait... Okay. Even the state of Cameroon has understood that, and they ask for the reduction of the surface of Soka Palm in 2005. operation. <laughs> So the communities all go to the administration to get land back, but Sokfin is uh, acting a bit behind the scenes to prevent this from happening. Was that, was that anything more? Uh, yet, avez-vous quelque chose à ajouter? Moi? Uh, oui. <laughs> oui, c'est... On peut ajouter quelque chose. Quand je dis non, je dis avec les collaborateurs. C'est que ce qui se passe aujourd'hui, comme tout n'a de peu, nous disons que c'est un plaidoyer fort pour nos communautés impactées par les activités de ce pays. So, um, yes, I would like to add something in the name of me and my colleagues. What happens today is a strong advocacy for what happens in our situation. It's a strong case. Mm -hmm. Et que les initiatives comme ça là continuent, ça va influencer les activités, et ça va influencer les décisions de ce sur le terrain. 
And initiatives like this must continue uh, because they will influence uh, the decisions of Soka Palm on the terrain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, was there any other question from the jury here? Y a-t-il des questions de la part du jury? Any further questions? Did you have another question? Did you have another question? Well, in that case, if there are no further questions, I will thank you, Emmanuel, and your colleagues for being here with us and for answering our questions. Puisqu'il n'y a pas de questions supplémentaires, je voudrais vous remercier, vous Emmanuel, ainsi que vos collègues, pour être ici aujourd'hui avec nous et pour avoir répondu à nos questions. Nous vous disons aussi merci. We also thank you. Mm -hmm. I will now call upon uh, uh, the defendants to come and present their defense ev uh, evidence if they have any. May I call upon defendants representing the ING group if there is anyone for the ING group to remain to come and share your evidence with the jury and the judges here. May I also call upon the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate. Both ING and the Dutch Ministry have been summoned. So if you are here, please come forward and present your evidence in defense. If there is no one, I will now hand over to the clerk of the court. Thank you. That means that um, we will be moving into recess shortly. There was a um, procedural inquiry from one of the members of the public jury addressed to the judges, something that you might uh, be willing to answer uh, when you give guidance before the verdict by the public jury is passed. And the question is, why is it so difficult to prosecute, uh, in this case, ING Group, but also some of the other transnational corporations under existing law and through existing tribunals? And what are the outer consequences or maximum impacts that people's tribunals or non-official tribunals can or should have? So possibly this is something that the uh, judges are willing to take onto their, on, into consideration to, uh, into responding after uh, the recess, which will be 20 minutes. We will reconvene here at 4.25 before hearing the final uh, witness and move into the public jury verdict. So we return here at 4.25. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. The court is now back in session. Chairing Judge Rade de Souza, Judges Sharon H. Van, Van Razighan Maharaj, and Nicolas Hildyard about to arrive, are or will be presiding. And I will hand the word to Chairing Judge Rade de Souza. Later, later. No, 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 later. I will ask you. Oh. We still have one more witness. No, but the question was about tribunal. Later. Um, welcome back, everyone. We, uh, we will now hear our uh, third witness. And uh, the third witness is from Brazil. And Fabrina Furtado, who will present her evidence on the on the impact of uh, of of ING on the people of Brazil. But before I do that, I will call upon the clerk of the court to please read out the charges. For those members of the public jury who have just joined on your seat, you will have found a charge sheet that is this document. We're going to be reading from the uh, charge sheet, the third charge concerning comrades past, present and future in Brazil. The first charge reads as, sorry, it's the third charge, point one from the third charge, reads as following, the ING group aided abetted and incited several artificial legal persons, prominent amongst them being four artificial legal persons known as the ABCD group. That includes Archer Daniels Midlands, an American national, a second named Bunge, originally a Dutch national established in 1818, who has since acquired multiple nationalities, including the British overseas territories of Bermuda. Bermuda. The third named Cargill, an American national and the fourth named Louis Dreyfus Company, a Dutch national, and financed them to forcibly confiscate land, land belonging to the humans and non-humans in different regions of Brazil, to deforest those lands and establish monocultural plantations of soy and sugar cane for profit, use poisonous pesticides that has caused intergenerational harm to the health and well-being of all species, and engage in violence and repression against the inhabitants of different regions of Brazil. Second, ING Group financed Cargill, Bunge, and other artificial legal person named Kofco, a Chinese national, to purchase Viagril and Alianca, Brazilian nationals, after they were found guilty and fined 12 million reals for deforesting northern Mato Grosso regions and illegally establishing soy plantations there with a view to aiding and abetting Cargill, Bunge, and Kofco to continue the criminal activities in the place of Viagril and Alianza. Three, despite explicit prohibitions on buying, trading and exporting produce grown on confiscated and deforested lands, deforested lands in Amazonia after 2008, ING Group financed Bunch, Cargill, ADM and Kofco to purchase, trade and export agricultural produce illegally cultivated in different deforested regions of Amazonia. Four, the ING Group financed Bunch, LD, LDC and Cargill to forcibly confiscate lands belonging to the communities in the Tapajos re regions of Amazonia, in the state of Para, the Guarani indigenous regions of sovereign Brazil and the Munduruku nation in the regions of Planalto Santa Reno. Five, since 2000, ING Group has financed Bunch, Car Cargill and Luis Dreyfus Company to use poisonous pesticides over large areas of land causing harm to multiple generations of different species living in the regions, the rivers, waters and trees and deprive them of the conditions necessary for life. Six, ING Group has refused to disclose information about the number of artificial persons it finances to undertake harmful activities, the extent, scale and scope of the harms that are regularly caused as a result and the extent, scope and scale of activities undertaken by artificial legal persons acting on ING Group's financial directions. Seven, ING Group 
issued bonds to raise even more money under the name Green Bonds, with the intention of misleading the people of Brazil and those seeking to reclaim the conditions necessary for the lives of all species internationally and use the money raised through the Green Bonds to finance the expansion of Kofco, Bunch, Cargill and Luis Dreyfus Company and empower them to confiscate more land, the forest, larger areas of forests, expand commercial monocultural plantation agriculture and trade and export agricultural produce grown on confiscated land and acted as their overseer and financial supervisor. These activities, if proved to be true, constitute intergenerational climate crimes against past, present and future generations of humans, non-humans, cultures and ecosystems in Brazil under section 3, A, B, C and D of the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act. May I now call upon our witness, our third witness, to present evidence uh, on, uh, in support of the charges. Our third witness today is Fabrina Furtado. Fabrina is professor in the Department of Development, Agriculture and Society at the Federal Rural University of Rio de Janeiro. Furtado will address will present her evidence and use PowerPoints and other evidentiary material. And uh, I now call upon Fabrina Furtado to present your evidence. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, morning, hard time. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for inviting uh, me to share with you some of the findings that we've had in a few years of, of monitoring and um, researching and from actions related to the agribusiness model in Brazil and the actors involved, including banks and, and investment funds. Um, I thank you for this opportunity, congratulate on, on the initiative and just like to briefly say that I would very much like to be with all of you now, but as you know, Brazil is one of the countries where the pandemic has been harder uh, to control or to live with. You know, we've had 607,000 deaths until now, uh, so we're living with the health uh, pandemic, but also a political pandemic with a liberal authoritarian government that ignores and worsens this reality, which is the Bolsonaro government. So I'm going to give, first of all, a brief uh, general overview uh, of what we're talking about when, when we discuss the agribusiness economy in Brazil, and then I'll go into uh, specific cases. So first slide please no, so we it's a historical process that doesn't start today no but from colonization and, and all the processes related to, to enslavement that that puts us in a situation of a, of from primitive accumulation to accumulation by dispossession which we will see through the slides next slide please <clears throat> So just briefly to say that from colonization, Brazil has been inserted into the global economy as a dependent and subordinate uh, country in the division, uh, international division of labor, going from being an object of dispossession to what today we call a platform for, night for financial valuation and a producer and exporter of primary goods to benefit the development of northern countries. Next slide, please. And as a result of this process, we have created a, a powerful agribusiness sector, becoming one of the biggest players in international agricultural markets, expanding the frontiers of accumulation and renewing forms of exploitation, including land, speculation and dispossession. Next slide, please. So this is just to, to show you how uh, the participations of commodities 
in total export has been growing in terms of concentration in the last few years from 2008 to, to now 2000 first month the first month of 2020 there has been an increased concentration of commodities in total exports and this is what the the development logic in brazil is based on the export of these commodities next slide please this is just to show the main products um being exported the first few they may change position but in general what we mostly export are soybeans uh then oil and mining related uh materials cellulose corn meat so uh, products related to the agribusiness, which includes um, agricultural commodities, but also mining and oil. Next slide, please. This is a list of the main uh, countries to which uh, we export, just to have an idea. This is this year. So, but these are, uh, for the last few years, have been the main countries uh, to which Brazil exports no? so it's china european union argentina netherlands is also one of the top countries which receives commodities uh, from brazil next slide please okay brazil has also become one of the four main destinations for transnational land deals worldwide increasing every year next slide please and these are the companies the main companies uh, involved in these land deals, no? many of which uh, have been mentioned as, as um, commodities traders that have received the support of ING. So Bungi, Cargill, Cossin, Kofco, Dupont, all them in the, in the field of agriculture are the ones mostly involved in these land deals. Next slide, please. In this map, now turning specifically to the production of soy, we can see how the, the the area planted with soya beans in Brazil has um, increased intensively uh, since the 70s until this is 2018, but the, the production continues to increase. So it's it's all over Brazil mainly now and, and um, going into the agricultural frontiers, overcoming the agricultural frontier, expanding on the agricultural frontiers every year. Next slide, please. And these are the corporations dominated specifically the, the production um, of soy in Brazil. Cargill, Bungi, ADM, LDC, Amagi, Gavlan, Kofco. Next slide, please. So now I will say a few words about um, what this means this agri, agri business economy means in terms of the territories in terms of of environmental and climate crime so we have uh, one of the highest uh, levels of deforestation uh, in the world which has been increasing uh, uh, started decreasing for a few years but in the last uh, this this year sorry last year and this year it has reached the highest levels uh, since 2008. Next slide, please. This is a map for you also to have an idea how agribusiness has uh, drastically reduced forests in Brazil. No, uh, So the first map in 1986 is specifically in the Mato Grosso region, which is one of the, the states most responsible uh, for for the production and, and exports of soy and meat and other products related to, to the agribusiness. So from 86 and 2016, we can see a drastic reduction in the cover of forests in, in that region. Next slide, please. And it's important to mention also that 90% of deforestation is a result of environmental crimes. Although there's an increasing uh, attempt to separate what is called illegal deforestation to, from legal deforestation, we see uh, both cases as a problem, especially because 96% of this uh, deforestation is a result of environmental crimes. Next slide, please. And a fifth of soy exports from the Amazon and the Sahado region to the EU are traced back to what is called illegal deforestation. Next slide, please. 
Ne. Okay. Um, and of course, these forests don't exist in empty spaces, although many uh, continue to try uh, to argue this, these, these forests are in territories occupied by different um, indigenous, traditional and, and small farmers uh, here in Brazil. And as a result of this agribusiness economy, Brazil has been for years now in the top of the list made by Global Witness of the, the deaths of land and environmental uh, defenders. This is 2018, but uh, the last, the other years also Brazil was between second and, and, and first also. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and this is land conflicts in Brazil to see that it has uh, also been increasing now and in the, the Bolsonaro government, especially, we have seen uh, an increase in the land conflicts uh, in the country. Next slide, please. Most of these conflicts are related to land conflicts as, uh, and related to agribusiness uh, corporations and large uh, farmers, and also uh, related to indigenous territories, or indigenous people struggling to maintain themselves in, in their territories. There are other conflicts related to labor issues and hate crimes, for example, against uh, the landless peasants movements or against indigenous movements, uh, but most of the, the cases are related to conflicts over land uh, in relation to agribusiness corporations and large farmers. Next slide, please. We are also one of the countries that most consumes uh, pesticide in the world. Next slide, please. And this is a graph that shows the number of pesticides being registered in, in Brazil throughout the years. Uh, to mention that the last two years, the last few years of the, of the Bolsonaro government has seen a, a record in, in pesticides registered in a country, most of which uh, are prohibited in the EU. Next slide, please. This agribusiness economy leads to highly concentrate, concentrated uh, land in Brazil, where just 1% of rural properties occupy almost half of all rural areas, while smallholder hold, farmers with less than 10 acres occupy only 2.3%. Next slide, please. And this land concentration uh, has, is also related to our history of colonization and slavery being one of the most uh, racist um, countries in the world with highly concentrated of land um, held by, by whites in the country. So the larger the land, the more white it is. And the, the, the smaller the pieces of land are owned by African, Brazilian or indigenous people. Next slide, please. No. And it's and it's interesting also to 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 show how the agribusiness is white in terms of what it what is produced. So if you look at the the soya plantations, uh, the majority of the the owners of land producing soya are whites, which is the the white the the sorry the blue the blue part, and the yellow is the black uh, population. Coffee, uh, sugarcane, corn are also extremely white and when you go down to to uh, artisanal fishing or, or extractive uh, artisanal extraction in in forest then these are products that are mostly carried out by black and indigenous people next slide please agribusiness is also male the majority of of owners so the major are, are male so the land tenure and land titles are, um, are mainly in the hands of of white men here in Brazil. Next slide, please. So this is mainly to say that the the Brazilian developmental logic is based on a, a agribusiness economy. So based on the the extraction um, of natural resources, uh, the the production and exports of commodity that are that that requires constant pressure both in terms of extensive and intensive pressure 
uh, to expand. So in, in terms of extens uh, extensive pressure, what we're talking about is that companies need to constantly require, acquire more land, appropriate, privatize or grab uh, more land. And in terms of intensive pressure, it means more environmental crime, deforestation, more uh, intensive use of pesticide and um, uh, uh, illegal uh, uh, labor uh, relations or exploitation of labors or even modern slavery, which is very common also in regards to the agribusiness economy. So whatever bank that supports and funds this process like ING is doing, is funding and supporting and intensifying land concentration, land conflict, the use of pesticides and all of this that, that the use of pesticide means in terms of deaths and communicate and contaminations of peoples, of lands, of soils, of water, and the end of their making their livelihood an impossibility, as well as as well as supporting the continuation of racism and gender disc discrimination in the country. Next slide, please. So now I will just look at some specific cases for us to, to have a, a, a better idea of ING's involvement in, in all of this conflict and environmental crimes. Next slide, please. So first of all, uh, it's important to mention that the Dutch state has a responsibility in these actions, uh, not only for giving, uh, subsidizing various processes, but also the production of knowledge and um, the uh, ideological support that allows for for these uh, for a bank such as ING to continue to support such projects here in Brazil. Now these are the few cases uh, where the Brazilian and Dutch ministers of transport, for example, signed a memorandum of understanding on infrastructure. Then in 2012, Arcades, a consultancy firm elaborated a large work plan for the Ministry of Transport, mapping out Brazil's rivers uh, and waterways for transport, uh, giving priority to, to the transportation of soya beans. And then uh, two years later, the, the Arcades also elaborated a, a report on these, on these possibilities where the consultancy firm uh, identified the Tapajós River, which I will, will talk about in, in a couple of minutes, in the, in, in the state of Pará, in the Amazon, as having a large potential for soy, for soy transport. Then in, in 2013, uh, collaboration with Dutch Knowledge and Research Institute, subsidized by the Dutch state, to create Dutch business opportunities coordinated by Panthea uh, came up the, with uh, proposed multi-cycle transport corridors in Brazil as part of a Brazilian Dutch corporation in the field of infrastructure. They came up with various different transport corridors, but um, put emphasis uh, on the so-called center north corridor as a priority which covers 74 several infrastructure options uh, in the region, which is from Mato Grosso to Pará. So to get the, the production from Mato Grosso transported to the ports of Pará to then be exported uh, to those country mentioned above, reducing the costs uh, of transport. And, and the priority in this center north corridor is a railroad that goes from Mato Grosso to Santarém, which I will talk about at the end of this presentation. Next slide, please. So ING has been supporting global commodities traders in Brazil, uh, dominated by four companies, no? uh, ADM, Bungi, Cargill, and LDC. Um, next slide, please. Which are, are related to a few uh, specific cases. Next case, please. Next slide, please. So. Before I do so, it's, it's important to emphasize the difficulty that we have here in Brazil to access information on, on the operations of ING, ING specifically to, to what companies, what operations, what projects uh, the country, the bank is involved with, uh, making it very difficult to hold the bank accountable and uh, uh, allowing it to further its, its operations 
with not much scrutiny from, from the country. Next slide, please. Uh, so first of all, a uh, case which has uh, recently been denounced is the involvement of Kahjiu, Bunji and Kofko uh, in, in buying soya that was produced uh, by a producer that had been already fined by the government for 12 million reais for being involved in deforestation. So these three companies bought from Viagra and, and Alianza that were buying soy from this, this producer that had already broken the Brazilian legislation, uh, environmental legislation, deforesting uh, areas of, of forests. Next slide, please. Bungi has also been denounced in, in other processes for being one of the, the companies most responsible for, for the destruction of the Brazilian Cerrado in 2020 due to deforestation and, for example, buying uh, from a company that was responsible for the deforestation of an area twice as large as Manhattan. So this company, uh, um, indirectly, but, but very much directly involved in, in deforestation of, of areas in the country. Next slide, please. They are also directly in, uh, and indirectly involved in processes related to land grabbing and land deals, which all lead to territorial ex expropriations of indigenous and traditional people, either directly or indirectly making their ways of living impossible due to, to the use of pesticides, to pollution, to contamination. So one of the cases for it is, again, uh, Bungi, Kaju and LDC that are buying land in Topajon region that, where there is evidence of land grabbing, leading also to increased speculation and land conflicts. Next slide, please. A case which was also very much denounced was one involving the Guarani indigenous people in Mato Grosso, which accused Bungi of buying sugarcane produced uh, on, on their land, so on, on land stolen uh, from the Guarani people. Next slide, please. This is an, an image so showing the plantations. Next slide, please. And an indigenous uh, Guarani leader saying, no, we don't want sugar cane on our land. It hurts our health, including the health of our children and elders, and it poisons contaminated uh, the water. Next slide, please. Another case which we can mention involving indigenous people is, is Kajiu, uh, which was denounced for buying soil from farms uh, in, in conflict with the Munduruki indigenous territory in Santarém, Pará. Next slide, please. This is an image of, of the plantations and, and resulting from uh, deforestation. Next slide, please. Yeah. These companies, as I said, are largely involved in land deals. And since 2000, there have been at least 250 land deals involving 213 different foreign enterprises to promote grain crops, forestry projects, energy projects, livestock farms, mining, and so on. Uh, Bungi, Kajiu, and Kofko are amongst the foreign companies mostly involved in the, these deals. So these land deals, they accelerate the expansion of agriculture frontiers, increase new re rentism strategies of capital accumulation, rises land prices, intensifies land conflicts, and, uh, and force small producers, indigenous people, and others uh, to leave their land. Next slide, please. Another case which we can also uh, mention is relating Cargill in the Tapajós region, responsible for the construction of a port complex with the capacity to ship 5 million tons of grains per year, uh, which has been, uh, since it was uh, before the construction and, and ever since, identified as a decisive factor for the growth of production of soya affecting indigenous riverine and Kilobolas peoples in the region. Next slide, please. Cargill has been uh, denounced for fraud in the licensing reports, 
for non-compliance with commitments assumed with environmental agencies, uh, accused of uh, depriving indigenous peoples, Kilombola and riverine peoples, of their natural resources essential to their livelihood, to production and reproduction, all of which have, have taken place without prior consultation, which goes against the International Labour Organization. Um, and also due to the transportation of, of all the soil in the region, the uploading and uploading of the grain, uh, we see large curtains of toxic dust, which affects the rivers, affects the fishes, and so affects rivering peoples that depend on their Tapajós River for their livelihood, as well as families living near the port. Next slide, please. Now to end, I'll just uh, bringing a few uh, um, phrases by these peoples affected uh, by these companies, no, especially Kaju and, and Bumji, no. So Kaju is responsible for drastic and irreversible changes in our way of life. Fishing has become unfeasible after the transformations promoted by the port. Ten years ago, you used to go down here on the riverbank to catch a fish. You only had to bring a net of 50 meters. You sold fish like you sold it. This is Cesar, a fisherman from the Tapajós River. Next slide, please. This is an indigenous leader, Alessandra Munduruku, says, with soy, what we see is deforestation increasing more and more to make room for its expansion. As a result, our rivers, our streams are drying up. We indigenous people do not make soup out of soy. We don't feed our children with soy. We see these many soy plantations, sometimes 100,000 hectares, just by one owner. Land and more land and deforestation. This quest for more and more land. In the entire region where Kaju is located, they are destroying nature all around and expelling and threatening the indigenous peoples that live there. Next slide, please. Another uh, indigenous leaders in the Tapajó uh, region says, Kaju is a symbol of agribusiness and deforestation. What for capital is development, for us, it is going backwards. It is a symbol of so many impacts for the people of the forest and for the people of the waters. Kajio for us is a symbol of destruction. Next slide, please. Now, this is a, a Quilombola, no, uh, descendant, uh, African descendant in rural communities, who says that the grains fall from the boats and the fish end up feeding on it. And it has the negative impact on the taste of the fish and on our skin. The fish in general starts to have a different kind of flavor. It no longer tastes how it used to when they lived in clear waters and fed only on fruit. Next slide. So um, to, to I've, I lost track of time, so <laughs> but uh, I uh, have about five minutes um, to go. I just want to say a few words on on refinance, next slide please, which is uh, very high on the agenda uh, nowadays. And, and basically what we question is what is being done in name of in the name of the climate. No? So agribusiness, more specifically, is one of the fastest growing sectors in the global market for so-called green, social or sustainable financial instruments. The total value of green bonds devoted to agriculture and land, for example, has increased by 59 percent between 2019 and 2020. ING is a major player directly uh, related to the green bonds or supporting the agribusiness companies to do so. Next slide, please. Just give a couple of examples. Kofco has a sustainability linked loan with the support of ING. Next slide, please. So does LDC, again, uh, with the support of ING and Robobank. Next slide, please. Oh. With, with implications which we don't even quite know yet, uh, the full extent of the implications, but we do know that it provides a further argument to roll back on the much needed social and environmental regulation while still depending heavily on governments to generate demand through laws and policies on green investments. So with the creation of investment funds, for example, another uh, implication is that foreign capital can buy bonds and have an opportunity to evade restriction on foreign ownership of land uh, in Brazil. Next slide. Companies will be able to claim that they are reducing emissions or that are, are green, getting paid, for example, via carbon credits or, or uh, green bonds, 
while not changing practices and leading to other conflicts related to so-called avoided deforestation or forestation products, most of which will lead to an increased race for land, threatening the livelihood of forest peoples and waters people and violating food security and sovereignty. Next slide, please. They allow dirty companies, many of which are supported by ING, as we have seen, to raise funds, clear their name of environmental concerns, while continue to engage in overall environmental and socially problematic practices, as seen here. Next slide, please. The net zero emissions targets, nature-based solutions, ESG and sustainable and all green finance narrative is used to legitimize the agribusiness model, guarantee expansion and increase corporate territorial control. Not only do they create disputes over land and territories occupied by different peoples, uh, they also incorporate their knowledge into the logic of the market, as we see with many projects related to the bioeconomy, but they also blame communities for environmental problems, hiding the role of large landowner, agribusiness, banks, investment funds, and the state itself. Next slide, please. So just to end, uh, I would like to, to mention, as you saw uh, in the slide, the relationship with the Brazilian government and the Dutch state, that the Tapajós region was mentioned as a priority, as was uh, the center north corridor and specifically a railroad. This is a railroad that is raising various concerns uh, for communities already impacted by the soya related infrastructure project, but uh, that now are fighting against the construction of a hydroelectric complex this railroad and waterways that were in, in the reports uh, produced by Arcadis uh, related to the opportunities of D Dutch investment and Dutch corporations' involvements in infrastructure in Brazil. And this is a project that also involved Bungi, Cargill, Dreyfus and Amagi, uh, which count on ING uh, support. Uh, th this project is is a will be it's a railroad constructed from Mato Grosso to Pará, and what they state is is that the Cerrado, which is in, in in Mato Grosso, has less environmental restriction requirements than the Amazon, which will lead to high returns on investment. So you take the soya from a place where people are not looking at so much as the Amazon, where requirements are uh, are looser, and you transport it to Pará to then export to Europe and other countries. Next slide, please. This is this is uh, a map of the, the railroad. Next slide, please. And the concerns that, is that um, uh, multiplication of all the effects that we have already talked about. So more deforestation, contamination uh, of soils and of waters and of air and land conflicts. And the federal government has already stated that without consultation, it will auction the, pro the, the project by the end of this year. The construction of railroad is also one of the key drivers for Brazil to abandon the Convention 169 of the ILO, since it has not been consulted any of the indigenous people that will be directly affected by these projects. Next slide. This is an indigenous leader saying, no, our land is the closest to the railway and the study says it will not be impacted. We just have to remember the history of Bear, he won six three, which is a, a, a railway, and see the soybean plantations that are already bordering our reserve. Imagine with this ferrogrão, there are already pesticides killing all our fish. After this project, businessmen will come and will force with more force and cut more forests. We need to be heard about the problems that already exist and those that are yet to come. Next slide, please. And why does this all happen? because Brazil is the country of impunity and banks like ING know that. Agribusiness corporations from all over the world know that. Less than 10% of assassinations of land and environmental defenders go to trial, it's around 8% of cases. Less than 3% of environmental crimes lead to any source of payment of accusation of condemnation. So we say that is this the comparative advantage that Brazil has and that interests actors such as ING. Okay, just the next slide you can pass very quickly, which is just wanted to say that there is a lot of resistance uh, going on by indigenous peoples, quilombolas and riverine 
small farmers, uh, uh, organizations in support of these peoples, uh, research institutions, you can pass the slide. To denounce all of these environmental crimes, to defend these, these territories and all that these territories mean uh, to the various peoples that live in them. Next slide, please. Okay, that's it. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabrina, for your contributions and your very clear uh, facts that, and, and uh, points that you made today. Um, may I now ask the judges if they have any questions for Fabrina? Yeah? Yes, you can just, as, as precise as you can. Yes. Um, Maito Ricardo, uh, uh, Fabrina, a very good presentation, a lot of detail as well, yeah? Um, so I'm going to try brief, in the last slide that you presented, you make mention of the fact that ING is aware of the conditions that it is supporting and it seeks to make higher returns based on those conditions. Could you provide us with some details of how, from this, uh, all of the data that you have shared, has this been presented in a way in which INJ, uh, INJ and the Dutch government have been able to respond? And if, it, if I'm allowed, very specifically, because I see in the data that you present, after 2014, 2015, there seems to be an increase, an acceleration in some of these criminal activities, even whether it's legal or illegal. <laughs> However, that's defined, deforestation is deforestation. Yeah? So has there been any specific change in the behavior since the coup in Brazil? And as a consequence of that, has there been uh, a response from the Dutch government and IMJ? Do I, do I reply now? Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. So I think that the, there are two ways of, of seeing this, no? Uh, one is what happens in the territories and the other one is the narrative used by companies and used by institutions such as the ing a clear answer first of all no there has been no response from the ing or from the dutch government in relation to these processes since the coup in brazil we have seen a rise of a discourse uh, from the agribusiness on sustainability we, we have seen letters uh, uh, signed by agribusiness corporations, by investment banks from around the world involved in deals in Brazil, calling for uh, a reduction in deforestation and for improvements in the indigenous policies. On the other hand, however, we see this as a strategy because what these companies are giving as a, res as, as a response to these anti-environmentalists and, and anti-people's policies is more green economy, is more uh, nature-based solutions. Uh, no, so more public, uh, how do you say, um, ad advertisements-related strategies, but that also don't only clean their images, but guarantee more accumulation. So they can legitimize themselves while creating further products and services based on the extraction uh, the continued extraction of the environment and all the effects on, on, on the peoples that we have mentioned. So th this is a strategy to maintain extraction, not to stop it. So we want ag a sustainable agribusiness to continue to expand soya plantation, to continue to expand oil and mining, etc. What we see is the expectations are a rise in these productions and not a decrease. So no response. 
And what I mean that, that um, they know what is going on is that this has been historic. For years, we have a model that is based on environmental crime, environmental racism, uh, discrimination of women and all these de devastations that I have shown. So they know this is precisely why these corporations are in Brazil in the first place. So uh, any institution that fin funds any of this, these corporations know exactly what they're coming into. So, but they hope that this impunity will, will let them uh, continue to acting as they always, always have. So no response and no expectations of response. Okay. Any any others? If you have any questions, yes. <clears throat> Thank you for that very very clear presentation. Um, it's shocking presentation. Uh, <clears throat> I'd just like two questions um, just to clarify a couple of things. You, want, you, you talked about one, of the, one part of the uh, uh, role of the Dutch state um, has been in subsidizing uh, the companies um, and uh, I assume also ING. And I, I'd like to, uh, whether you could give some example of the types of subsidies that have been provided. So that's one question. Uh, you also talked about the ideological, uh, ideological support from the Dutch state. And I wonder whether I could ask you whether you consider what I'm about to read out to you as an example of that sort of ideological support. And I'm, I'm reading from FMO, the Dutch... Um, uh, development finance institutions website uh, where it's talking about investments it's putting into a particular um, uh, private equity fund um, that uh, deals in uh, agribusiness investments particularly logistics and technology and it it um, it describes the funding objective as being to foster um, private sector-led growth, um, but mainly to ensure stable and safe access to food supplies for a growing population. So the narrative being that um, these investments are necessary to feed a growing population. And I wonder whether you could comment on that and whether you consider that sort of narrative, which is a in my view, a very one-sided narrative, is um, propaganda um, and the sort of ideological support that you were um, describing. And, and my last question relates to your slide on resistance, um, <clears throat> and particularly to those efforts being made within Brazil to build an alternative um, economy, an alternative way of of uh, livings that do not involve the um, exploitation and financial crimes that you described. And I just ask, you know, um, are there investments in that economy that ING could have been making? In other words, did it make a choice to invest in the destructive as opposed to other forms of less, of, of um, uh, more socially coherent and cohesive um, and environmentally coherent and cohesive um, investments. Okay. Um, in terms of subsidies, um, which I mentioned, they go from direct support to the, to the corporation, but also when they support, uh, come to Brazil and, and, write up a, a, a memorandum of understanding with, with the government when they support research institutions uh, from Holland you know, to, to come up with a plan of, of infrastructure, uh, when they support the production of knowledge, you know, when they map out a, a, a region of the Amazon and state that this region has a potential for transport and has a potential to increase the the exports of soy as an as an example no or, or to to reduce the costs 
of exports of, of soil, they are subsidizing this model also. So it's not just the direct funds that are given to corporations. This is, this is I think it's an important discussion because it, it, it's what they also use as a strategy to say, it's not our responsibility. No, it's it's not to, to count on the whole chain involved. So if they give funds to Bungi and Bungi buys from another company and this company buys from an illegal producer, they can say, but we didn't know. We supported only one company. Or they can say that that, that they, they aren't directly involved. But when they produce knowledge, showing and emphasizing uh, with the Brazilian government, this is a region that has the potential to be exploited even more than it is. This river has the, the potential of, of being exploited by Dutch companies more than it is. With this exploitation, these companies will reduce the cost of, of their export. They are, in, they are directly involved in legitimizing these kinds of, of projects. So it's not the, just the direct money they give to, to, to corporations. It also producing the knowledge and supporting the production of knowledge necessary to legitimize and, and guarantee the advancement of these projects. Uh, one of the main arguments that agribusiness has had is that what they do is to feed an increasing um, amount of population. There's so many things wrong with that. It's, it's difficult to know where to begin. First of all is the, the neo Malthusian uh, arguments that were all the whole problems that we we face in the world is due to population increase which also leads to blaming the the more impoverished and the, and more specifically black people for all the problems in the world because they they can't stop having children the second is that as one of the indigenous leaders says we don't make soup out of soy my children don't eat soy these products are not produced for food first of all they don't stay in the country and second of all, soy, for example, go to feed cows. They don't go to feed most of most of these pro these products. They don't go to feed humans. The sugar cane produced now is 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 used also for agrofuels, no, to deal with with the the the, the denunciations in relation to to the, the climate costs of of these corporations. So these products don't produce food. They don't stay in the country. Uh, and what they do produce is full of pesticides, so it kills people, contaminates, uh, and it and it kills people, and it uses up much more land than than other products use. Here in Brazil, and uh, and I'm guessing in in many other countries, eighty percent of the food that we eat is produced by small farmers. It's not produced by agribusiness. Um, Thirdly, in regards to alternatives, what we have seen is a, is a historic de decrease in any kind of support for, for this, this production that feeds us, you know, for agroecology, for, for the production that, that takes place with, with just uh, labor relations, that is organic, that doesn't use pesticides that discusses the whole the whole chain the whole model of the production of food so we have seen a decrease in any kind of support uh, this has been historic in brazil no agri business has approximately 80 percent more funds than than the products produced by agri uh, family farming or produced by other communities um, and this is is becoming even worse now with the with the bolsonaro government so there's always a choice there's data, there's evidence, there's production of, of reports, of videos, uh, events that are called on by social movement, by organizations and by research groups. So there's definitely a choice and a choice has been made. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Fabrina. Thank you very much for that. Uh, before I open up, questions for the jury. I think we have another Brazilian here who would like to contribute and to add to Fabrina's presentation here. So may I ask Angelica de Freitas e Silva to say what she wishes to say. Thank you, Rada. Fabrina, muito obrigada. Before I start, I would like to say Marielle Presente. 
in her name and on the name of all of our leaderships who fell fighting the militarized historical forces against our resistance. So Marielle is one who felt not for this specific struggle that we are discussing today, but by the same forces. So I would like uh, to link what you said and the importance of this um, to the Dutch government being historically linked uh, to the ING's uh, uh, corporate crimes, uh, environmental crimes. Because the first time the Dutch arrived in Brazil at 16 something, they weren't uh, the Dutch state, they were the West India companies, the Dutch West India. And they remained as so until the 18 somethings when the Dutch government, uh, well, they, they, they left before that, but the name, the company, not exactly in Brazil, but elsewhere, uh, the company was um, uh, an independent uh, corporation linked to the Dutch government. Something very important for us realizing here by linking uh, ancestral, uh, um, our ancestry to the transgeneration, transgenerational uh, um, cr uh, climate crimes is that uh, capitalism hasn't been established in itself and it's not just about profiting and, and capital accumulation. It arrives as a colonial combo and you evidence that really well how the colonial combo works in Brazil. These colonialities, they are co-constitutive and inseparable. Racism, patriarchy, uh, territorial racism, geopolitics, the oppressor's historiography that we are taught in our schools, epistemic violence, militarism, colonial knowledge, and above all, the role of law of the colonizer that remains for no explainable reason to this very day, allowing that states and corporations together historically are exhausting resources and our vital energy. On that, I would also like to bring again Alessandra Munduruku on a very, very brief poem that I'm going to read in Portuguese and translate it to English, and I'll finish my, my intervention. Um, Alessandra Munduruku said, um, she denounced that the World Alternative Water Forum fame in 2018, what the Brazilian disgovernment of Bolsonaro and his uh, gang are doing to the territory of uh, their people uh, in the state of Pará, something that uh, you have mentioned very well and clearly. So, quoting Alessandra. Os rios são nosso sangue. A água é sagrada, é nossa mãe. Queremos nossa floresta de pé, nossos rios limpos. Estão matando a natureza, querem exterminar nós, filhos da terra e das águas. Mas nós, Munduruku, não vamos deixar. Vamos fazer alianças com ribeirinhos, quilombolas, pescadores. Vamos lutar juntos com outros países e povos. As hidrelétricas, ferrovias, mineradoras, a soja não vai passar. Nosso sangue vamos derramar e, se for preciso, para o Tapajós e todos os rios salvar. E agora eu vou with com a translação. The rivers are our blood, water is sacred. Our mother. Uh, uh, water is sacred is our mother. We want our forests standing, our rivers clean. They're killing nature. They want to exterminate us, children of land and waters. But we Munduruku, we won't let it. Let's make alliances with riverine dwellers, quilombolas, fishermen. Let's fight together with other countries and peoples, hydroelectric, railways, mining companies. The soybean shall not pass. Our blood will we will spill and if necessary for tapajós and all rivers save so to end my my intervention is to say that our struggle is for life not for the right to live our struggle is for having the capacity of surviving the territory without having to uh, mimetize coloniality for the very survival 
So when one comes to say, oh, but if you remove the company or the investment, what are they going to do in Amazonia, in Mato Grosso, in Pantanal? Or the, what, what's going to happen then if you take Ma Valley out of Brumadinho, where there was a dam collapse that killed over 300 people and the crimes are still uh, unsolved? as well as Marielle Franco's crimes unsolved and all the ING crimes in Amazonia and the rest of Brazil are unsolved. Because this law is not made to protect us. To make my final remarks, reflecting about intergenerational climate crimes uh, necessarily involves planning. This word that has been captured by the colonial disciplines of business management. They think of planning as means to guarantee a future within the constraints of linear historiography of modernity and its institutions, grounded in the colonial intention of domination. As the prosecutor was speaking earlier, um, this, this uh, business financial oriented language that is difficult, intentionally epistemically violent is uh, intentionally made to detach any type of decolonial planning, any type of local control and any possibility of uh, decolonized peoples taking back that right, uh, sovereignty, uh, their um, authority over their bodies and their territory. So the challenges of using the rule of law to protect the most vulnerable demands deeper knowledge about how the tools that we used to fight, such as legal uh, mechanisms, substantive law and procedure, were historically formed and attributed of meaning. In doing so, the painful realization that this framework of rights is rooted in colonialities and will therefore demand violence to be viable. So we don't want the right to live, we want to live. Thank you, Alessandra, very much for your talk. Thank you for that intervention from Brazil. We are happy to have another intervention. Uh, I can now op throw it open to the members of the jury to ask Fabrina questions. Uh, or, yes? Um, sitting here as, as a member of a jury that um, can sit in judgment of these assholes, um, I am curious about what, uh, uh, in the local situation there, what is the dynamic between courts and laws and uh, the direct um, people who are impacted? It, um, uh, with this intervention that um, I just sat through, I'm inspired to ask what is the role that we uh, here in sitting in judgment of a situation far away can play with our with our evil eyes cast in the direction of ING um, and our judging feelings of that, um, and then also specifically within within Brazil, what is the dynamic between courts and um, people's movements? I, I'm sure it's varied and multiplying, um, you know, how do you trace those feelings? Sure, sure. Yeah. Yes, Fabrina. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, so I'll start with, with that, that question. Um, uh, hang on. Angelica mentioned Brumadinho. No, the, related to Valley, uh, where a dam uh, exploded, killing uh, over 200 people, workers of Valley mainly, including its own workers. But six years ago, there was another environmental crime, one of the largest environmental crimes known to history, uh, involving Samarco, which is Valley, but also B.H. Uh, Billington, translate the... <laughs> the words in my head, six years ago, killing people, killing their livelihood, destroying territories, destroying land, uh, destroying the whole region, which based all of their lives on a, a bacia, the basin, uh, Rio Doce, Rio Doce Basin. Um, so ask me if after six years, these peoples have re received reparations. 
after six years has anyone been, been accused or had to pay for this environmental crime? No. Six years and the peoples are still struggling to be recognized as affected people by this environmental crime. So that is the relations between affected people and courts in Brazil. We did, uh, we do have one or two uh, you know, people that we can count on in the public attorney, but, but these are also people that, that go, uh, are threatened, that have their lives threatened, and some of them leave the cases because their families are being threatened. And for a while, uh, these were the people considered also an obstacle to development in Brazil. So any public defender that is in the support of the, the communities and the peoples affected are also in danger. Are also defenders that, that um, are in danger, most of them, if they don't continue, if they're not killed, they leave uh, the, the cases. So the pressure on, on the support is, is immense. And, and Increasingly, even even now with the uh, even more so now with the Bolsonaro government, it's a whole architecture. No, it's the executive, it's the legislative, it's the judiciary, it's the the means of communication, it's the education system. No, it's a whole architecture that works together to guarantee that this model is in place and continues uh, to be to be reproduced. And many of these, these uh, communities and peoples uh, are threatened also in their struggles. No, they, they, many are killed, as, as, as I showed you, and, and many are threatened. So some leave the country, they, they go on to do other things because they are afraid for themselves, for their lives and for, and for their families. And um, we have a program here in Brazil, which is a, a called Program for, for Environmental Lands and Human Rights Defenders. But how can it work if the state gives with one hand what it takes from the other? How can it work if it's the state that is responsible for these defenders being in, um, threatened in the first place? So it, it cannot work. And just to, to, to relate to this and, and what Angelica mentioned um, is that, that yeah, colonization as we know it may have ended, uh, but we, lived, we live under coloniality and modernity which is based on the logic of progress, on the logic of development. And most, a lot of the arguments that these companies give is that they create jobs, they create development. So how, is, how will, even in progressive governments, this was the case, no? Progressive governments in the whole of, of Latin America pushed forward what we call the consensus of commodities. And one of the arguments was to fund social policies to fund um, other policies. And what we see is first that the jobs created are temporary, uh, mostly involve dangerous activities where workers are contaminated. Um, they, they end after a few months. Most of the, the high, more qualified jobs are given to people that don't live in the regions where these projects are established. And there is another issue, which is uh, the Dutch disease. So, most of you probably know, or, or Maldição dos Recursos Naturais, uh, I forgot the name now, but it's, it's the fact that uh, countries which have abundancy in natural resources uh, will be all, uh, constantly uh, stuck uh, in, in, I don't want to use the word of development, but it doesn't lead to the development, doesn't even lead to the development that they are talking about. There are deficits in, in, in Brazil's accounts because even in the, the super af, super af, no, the excess in, in commercial in, in exports is not enough to, to counterbalance the deficits related to all of these um, um, foreign companies. So it's not a model that creates not even the development, the economic development that they are talking about, let alone the, the, the other forms of, of lives that, that we are talking about. And um, as Angelica was saying, what, what, what came to Brazil and what persists is not just an economic system, it's a gender system, it's a racial, a knowledge system, a religious system, a division international of labor, class system, a uh, uh, militarization of system based, based on states, which is based uh, on the domination of nature, on the domination of women, on the domination of, of, of black people and all of those populations that 
that produce knowledge or, or, or produce ways of living that doesn't separate nature from, from society, that sees nature as complement, complementary to, to, to their ways of living. Uh, so this is, this is the way of living that, that is being tempted to being destroyed not only because they get in the way of, of uh, by occupying, by living in lands that, that these companies are interested in, but that they show us that another way of living in this world, a non-capitalist way, a way that doesn't dominate and exploit nature and other beings is possible. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Fabrina, for your uh, answers and your, question and your uh, responses. I will once again check or ask if there is anyone present for the defendants. If there is anyone present for the defendants, they have been summoned, the CEO of the ING group, as well as the Dutch Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate have been summoned. If you are here and wish to say something, please come forward. Okay, if there is no one, we will now proceed to the concluding uh, part of our hearing today. May I call upon our prosecutor, Rodrigo Fernandez. You have heard three witnesses who have given evidence on ING and its role in their countries and their territories and people. If you could just sum up your morning presentation, linking it to the witnesses and your comments on how you assess the evidence. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> well, I think that the, the evidence presented, uh, the three cases uh, speak for themselves. And I think that they clearly show, uh, well, the first point, I tried to make this morning that uh, if we look at the present and the past uh, of ING in terms of intergenerational justice, um, it is on the wrong side of history. Um, it is clearly well visible in all of these three cases that uh, it is in the DNA of finance capital to profit from externalizing the state of the planet. Uh, it, it is very clear um, and what is perhaps more important to stress after seeing these cases uh, and in particularly I think the last case made it very clear with this perhaps a bit of a cynical observation that uh, impunity is a comparative advantage it is a commodity uh, injustice is a commodity it is valuable it, uh, it is a source of profits. Um, is that uh, this logic of externalizing uh, the planet is encoded in the law. Uh, and it is uh, those that uphold the law uh, that are defending, uh, facilitating these practices. And so it is the law itself that is... Uh, that lies at the basis of this type of behavior. So if we think, if we move on, of, so how could we think of remedies? Uh, it's not simply about divesting. It's not simply about exiting. It's not simply asking ING to stop funding, to stop uh, emitting bonds, green bonds, uh, to fund these practices. It is first and foremost uh, to, to, to think of remedies, uh, forms of compensation uh, that uh, are suited for not only these cases, but well, cases on a much larger and structural uh, way. And beyond that, next to the compensation and remedies, is to think of you know, what are then the alternatives that we are asking ING to be part of, to fund, if we want it to be part of a future endeavor. Uh, and I think uh, um, that uh, also these three cases make it abundantly clear that uh, uh, most of the problems arise from a very top-down type of structure that is imposed in a particular context. Uh, and that 
we really need to democratize, not simply in the core, in our once in a four times election, but it is about um, yeah, at different levels of, of democracy. We, we cannot allow to have finance uh, or projects being financed in these contexts without people having a say in it. And this is exactly what is now occurring. And this is why I think that next to the Ministry of Economic Affairs, it's actually the Ministry of Finance that in the Netherlands that should be uh, also on trial here. And this is exactly what is now occurring uh, through uh, the maximizing finance for development framework that was put forward by the World Bank uh, four years ago that is being negotiated by the G20 will be discussed now in Rome. Uh, this is one of the main programs through which the rich countries in the world try to well, bring financial projects to the developing world without any say of people there involved. So this, th that is why I, 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 I remain to stress that democracy and democratization is an important part of it. Um, next to, of course, to think about compensation and remedies. And I think that all of this, all of these points are clearly well explained uh, through these three cases. And I think that they were uh, excellent choices. Uh, Mr. Prosecutor, may I also ask you to comment on something that you said in the morning about uh, the Dutch government actually joining with the EU that made the expansion of ING on the scale possible. Uh, to what extent is the WTO also responsible for allowing investment companies like the ING to become such a global phenomenon. We have seen three countries here from different continents who have been facing, you know, from Southeast Asia, Africa, and Brazil. These are really three continents that we have. So would you say, could you comment on how the WTO has played a part, if at all, in this? Well, the WTO is one of a few very important uh, players in basically rolling out uh, this legal infrastructure that facilitates many of these practices. Uh, but I think that next to the WTO, perhaps what is more important and something that comes back in all of these cases is and also what uh, came back in the first day uh, when the Dutch state uh, was indicted is this uh, are the special purpose entities or mailbox companies um, and I think that um, in two years time it would be good to commemorate uh, the history the legal history uh, of these uh, of, of, of mailbox companies because it was in uh, 1924, uh, at a conference of the League of Nations, the predecessor of the United Nations, that the then powerful capital exporting nations uh, constructed this legal principle. And this legal principle is very simple. Uh, it is about saying that you are somewhere without actually being there. Uh, so this is what a mailbox company in the end at its core does. And this is about creating complex structures to hide your activities and to create impunity, uh, but to enable corporations to extract value. And I think that the WTO does this for the aspect of uh, trading and investment, but uh, there's many other ways and this comes forward. Uh, and uh, in this very city, there are various buildings uh, where this comes back uh, very clearly. Uh, and I would say that, for example, the IBFD, so this is a, uh, an international organization that was set up in the 1920s to, uh, to uh, document uh, bilateral tax treaties, uh, has been here in this city ever since. And this lies at the core of how special purpose entities are able to structure corporations. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for that clarification. And uh, yes, the district, financial district of Amsterdam is a very old one. Um, may I now call upon the judges to very briefly direct the jury, very briefly, please. Yeah. Can we ask maybe from the clock? We have four minutes before the time we had agreed to end. Maybe we can ask the permission of people if we can have a few more minutes. Seems a very fair request. The request of the judges to the public jury is that in our official, in the schedule that was proposed to you, in which we ask you to contribute to evaluating um, the witness testimony, uh, we were going to end in five minutes. It is clear that we are most probably going to uh, uh, continue proceedings until 10 past 6 or a quarter past 6. Um, do we have your consent or does anyone object against the extension of the procedures for another 10 to 15 minutes? Of course, if you, are, uh, if you have other external obligations related to work or life, we fully understand it, but we also really validate uh, your presence because the judgment that is passed here is only as uh, valuable as, as, you, as uh, is only valuable due to your um, presence. This is what provides it legitimacy. I consider that we have the jury, public jury consent, so I Thank ask you. you to continue. Thank, Thank you me. very much uh, for that. And uh, the issues are very heavy, complex, so I appreciate the additional 15 minutes, and I'm sure the other judges too. So may I now call upon you, Rasigan Maharaj, to yes, di give some directions to the jury on what the issues are. Yeah, the comment from. Yeah, I think. Yeah. I want to do the comment first. Yeah, you go ahead. Okay. Uh, so uh, it's now good evening to all of the colleagues of the, of the jury, and we've had a long day. Um, in terms of what's been shared with us. And there are quite a few very significant issues. But as we heard from the morning, we're dealing with very complex issues as well. And because of that, it calls for a specialist language to describe things. But this is a specialist language of ourselves. <laughs> you know, it's not something that we found and then we start representing it. We created the language. So we should also be able and capable of deciphering the language and taking back ownership. It's not just technical terms thrown at us. These are technical terms that come from our social engagement. And as we heard in the last comment as well, we're talking of a century of things taking place. Things have happened over time. So I just want to highlight maybe three, three aspects from the three cases that we've seen. Yeah? The one and a clear point that was made, and that's the non-binary nature of the climate transition itself. And because of that, yeah, it's very clear this short-termism that seems to be embedded in what we are doing needs a very serious rethink. And part and parcel of that rethink is how we understand how our governments through the state acts and how it affords uh, certain privileges to particular institutions uh, that the government supports. In this case, the Dutch government and ING itself. Yeah. You know, it's shocking when we heard uh, from our colleagues in Cameroon, yeah, because this is a huge amount of wealth being transferred, <laughs> that there's no ING in Cameroon, <laughs> that there's no Dutch government in Cameroon. Yeah, when I searched on the internet, what I found was an honorary consul. Yeah. Yet that exploitative relationship still continues and is recognized as monies are transferred in and out of the territory itself. That's, I'm sure, people have heard. It's a shadow form of financing. And I think all of us are particularly uh, troubled by shadows. We need to be much clearer about this, yeah? You know, there's, a, there's an odd saying from, a, a, I think, maybe three or four presidents uh, of uh, the United States of America that you can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Unfortunately, where we are in terms of the ecology, it forces us to do both things. So even though we heard the comment being made, 
uh, that there are remedies that we need to seek, we need to also stop the practices that are accelerating us towards this precipice. Now, if nothing else from science, we know of a precautionary principle. And when we see the harm and we hear the evidence confirming the harm being perpetuated in our names through our institutions, I think it is a responsibility of us yeah, as a cooperative and social species to stand up for all the other species being affected by this. Yeah. In the Brazilian case, it was most clear because of the extensive nature of the presentation itself. You know, we are reproducing a racial capitalist political economy through what we are doing. None of us support that. Yeah. No one should support that. And we really need to act against these things. So even if, as we've heard, a small contribution to that is halting the practice and putting in place the necessary structural that will lead to infrastructural changes so that our institutions then serve us in building our resilience and our sustainability. So that's what I would encourage that we draw out of today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. May I ask Nick Heldia to summarize his thoughts and directions? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm an activist, and very often um, when confronting power, uh, people will say, well, you know, what's your alternative? If we don't do this, what's your alternative? And uh, I think like many other comrades around the world who are in the same position, I think my first question is always, well, whose alternative? Whose side are you on? Because there isn't one alternative to anything. Justice requires us to take sides and be very clear on whose side we operate. Um, so in this instance, in this court, I think if we're to do justice, the statute asks us to be on the side of those who uphold not just the right to survival, as Angelica might say, the, right, the collective right of all to survival, not just the right of a few to survive, but more than that, it demands that we uphold the conditions that allow life. That's a much bigger task to all of us. I think we're on the side of those who would ensure that those who challenge the powerful, who challenge and question the owner of a plantation that is damaging, that they do not have to go to bed each night as Emmanuel does and told us, worrying whether they'll even get to their homes at night without being assassinated or picked up by the police. So I think, you know, we have pointers to whose side we have to be on. And I think, um, this particular statute sets up not just, uh, doesn't just make it a crime to act in a particular way, to take an action that undermines life. It also criminalizes inaction to protect life. Omissions are as important as commissions. I think that's important. Standing on the sidelines, not taking a side, is taking a side. 
and it's in taking a side often on the side of injustice. So, I mean, what struck me today, and particularly with the role of the Dutch state in all of this, is just how, I mean, the prosecutor has set out very clearly how the Dutch state has taken certain actions that have undermined our collective right to survival, not least by unleashing finance, not for the public good, but unleashing finance for the sake of finance and for the profit of finance and for the profit of individuals by privatizing ING in the first place, by stripping away pension funds that could be used to actually put us onto a different trajectory. But I've been struck throughout by the choices that the Dutch government's made and ING have made deliberate choices. In ING's case, deliberate choices to invest where impunity and where environmental crime allowed and permitted in a way that enables profit-making. But with the Dutch government, they sat on the fence, even when it has become clear that coal production, coal-fired power stations, which they have known to be destructive for years, they have stood by and not banned investments by Dutch companies in coal, something they could have done. They stood by even after having stripped away the regulations on companies that would have required them to obey environmental and social regulations. Even after they've allowed those regulations to be replaced by voluntary codes of conduct, like the Equator Principles, even after it's become clear that those voluntary codes of conduct are completely inadequate to hold companies like ING to account, they have done nothing. They have not instituted the controls that they could have and should have instituted. So it's the omissions as much as the commissions that I think we should reflect on when we take a judgment. And I would, as a judge, and I have this privilege, direct the jury to do precisely that. Thank you very much. Would you like to? Yeah. I, I don't want to say too much, but I'd like to thank the prosecutor today for making a very clear case at the beginning of the day, of the day so that we could focus our minds on what we needed to think about. I just wanted to make one, one small comment about this process uh, of looking at intergenerational uh, climate crimes and intergenerational knowledge. If, if you know, I've been sitting here, Radha's been sitting, standing here. In my law, in my Cree law where I come from, I'm an indigenous person, we never go in this direction when asking people to speak. We only do that once. And that's when somebody has passed over. You start on this side and you go in that direction. So all day I have been resisting speaking first um, out, of, out of our own legal system. So you saw it in practice today. And the reason I raise that is because some, que some questions have arisen about this tribunal and what the court is doing and what, what potentially could happen in the future. I have been involved in these kind of things for more than 40 years. So I'm kind of an old person. So I speak from experience. In 1977, we went to the United Nations in Geneva and we said, we're still indigenous peoples, we're still alive. People were surprised to see us. We had people hanging out of the building of the UN with going looking at us, people coming up and touching us, feeling our hair, and you know, they, they just couldn't believe we were still here. We were not really recognized. So then we had another meeting here in Rotterdam. 
on the rights of indigenous peoples in, in the Americas, 1980, 81. Then we had another meeting in Geneva, again, pushing the rights of indigenous peoples. And now, you know, you have a declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples, 2009. It took us to 2009 to do that. But what, what I'm saying to you is that what you're hearing here today, or yesterday, and, the, you know, and, the, and maybe and tomorrow, you think, well, why am I even involved? Because it took, it's going to be a, a long time. Something that take, might take a long time to do. Yes, we know that. But colonization did not happen overnight. And to get out of this mess, it's not going to happen overnight. And I always tell our own people, and I talk quite often to our own people, especially our young people, and I always tell them, there's no instant putting solutions here, people. As, as when you identify the issue and you work on the issue, you work on it until it gets done. Then you get onto another issue or you divide the work amongst many people to work on different issues. But this is to expose the issues that are confronting us, but also confronting you who live inside of a state that has allowed this to happen. So we need to figure out how we're going to do this together, collectively, and also individually, because each individual can do something. It doesn't matter how small or how big it is, you can do it. And so, you know, I commend you for coming and staying and listening to us, listening to the people, but, you know, think about it in the longer term, because for us, I'm talking about my own people, we don't see anything as being important to me. It's got nothing to do with me. My responsibility is to the seventh generation from now, the ones that I don't even know. That's who I'm thinking about. And that takes it out of my being and my franticness that I didn't get anything done in the last 70 odd years of my life here on, in, on the earth. It leaves it, I left something for the future. I didn't give up the future. And I think that's what I heard from all of the three speakers today even though as desperate as they are in the situation that they are in, they're still thinking about the future. How can they rectify what's going on now? And I think that's what they're asking you to do is to help them to recognize that so that this thing, this what we're doing here means something not only to you, but to them. So that's why, you know, I'm saying to, to the members here, think about that when you're when you're being asked a question, whatever the question is today, I'm not sure what the question is today, but whatever it is, think about it seriously, and thank you very much. Hi, hi. Thank you very much for that summary. I, as my direction and in my concluding observations, I won't go into the evidence and what witnesses have said, you have seen it, other judges have commented on it. The prosecutor has spoken to it. So I won't say anything more. I just want to draw your attention to the statute itself and what is uh, climate crime. And climate crime is, and I want to refer to section 21D. E and F, yeah. Ecological conditions necessary for reproduction of different species. So anything that destroys the condition for species to reproduce and live their lives is a climate crime. It is, is, it falls within the definition of a climate crime. Socio-ecological conditions necessary to sustain reciprocal relationships between humans and non-humans. So anything that destroys our relationships to other species, to the plant world, the forest world, to the water world, to the other world, it also constitutes crime. Social conditions necessary for survival of human societies and cultures, that constitutes crime. And therefore, 
And if you look at the intergenerational climate crime section 3.1d, um, acts of commission or omission in the past or present that displace displaced people from places, fragment or fragmented communities and destroy and destroyed cultures. Today we saw that everywhere this has become an issue. People are being displaced. They don't have a ground to stand on and that is a crime. You cannot displace people. You cannot deny an animal the right to go to a river and drink water. You cannot and when you do that, that is a criminal act. Throwing people out of land is a criminal act. There is no law that is existing outside of this court that recognizes displacing people, displacing animals from their food and their water resources as a crime. And I say this because some of you are probably asking, why don't we go to the Dutch court? Why don't we go to, I don't know, some other international court? And the answer is very simple. Those courts do not recognize life as a given condition that the law must recognize. Not the right to life, but that living is foundation of any, anything really. Because if there is no life, there is nothing else. And that is why removing people from land, removing pe animals, plants, birds, denying them their, their modes of survival. So what, we, what this court is, wants you to focus on is what are the conditions that are necessary to live. And if those conditions are destroyed, that constitutes an intergenerational climate crime. So it's using that standard that I now call upon you to cast your, to, to, uh, cast your uh, vote as members of the jury. So all of you, those of you who think ING has committed intergenerational climate crimes in Brazil, in Cameroon, in B Indonesia, could you please raise your hands? Thank you very much. I think we have a very clear vote on that affirmation of guilty. Those of you who think that the Dutch government is complicit in allowing and enabling and facilitating ING to do what it does, could you please put your hands up? Thank you very much. I think that's a very, very clear mandate from the jury. We will now take away your views and we will try and put together our discussions and deliberations today in some form of judgment which will be available uh, very shortly and uh, we will be in, in and you will know about it when it is out. Thank you very much for your contributions today. That closes the hearing on case number three of 2021 by the Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes. Uh, video documentations of the proceedings now belong to the public domain from this moment onward. The judgment, as our chairing judge has just mentioned, uh, will be published, drafted collectively by the four judges here based on the uh, advice of the, uh, based on the, the vote of the public jury will be published in the coming weeks together with the video documentation and the evidence filed at this court in the various cases that you have seen today. It will be shared with different organizations and institutions invested in the struggle for climate justice, but it will also serve as the foundation of future cases of the Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes that we are currently preparing. The court wants to thank, in length of the chair and judge, all of its contributors, that means the public jury, for your uh, patience and for your uh, attention uh, and, and, lis and, and careful listening to, to thank the witnesses and um, the judges. Collective hearing, this act of collective hearing means uh, to give your time, to share your time in recognition of lost time and of violated time. We have seen many cases of chronocide today uh, when it comes to the, the destruction and the annihilation of time 
uh, and all that that uh, implies when it comes to shared ecosystem work. I want you to um, be very welcome to stay with us in this space just outside this door in the corner where little rain falls. I hope there will be a dinner available very soon or from this moment onwards. There are drinks um, in the back. We would love to keep you in this space uh, together with us. And I would like to bring your attention to the space upstairs where an important exhibition is um, presented by a collective of uh, undocumented and documented artists, designers, activists, organizers called We Sell a Reality. Uh, it is an installation that brings into evidence crimes committed by the European Union against undocumented migrants and refugees and its members, Hamo, Ait, Mohamed Noor and Elke Uitenthuis are present to share with you on different conditions, testimony and evidence of their work and experiences. We will proceed with case number four, concluding case, comrades past, present and future, versus Airbus, uh, tomorrow with two witnesses physically present, that will be Valentina Azarova from the Go Global Legal Action Network and Mohamed al Kashef from Watch the Med. That is tomorrow, Saturday, October 30th. We will start at 1 p.m. and we will be honored if you will be willing to join the public jury once more. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you. 